Welcome to the International Conference on Edge Computing and IoT, Systems Management and Security, EAI ICECI 2020. This is the first time and our great honor to have such an event to bring together computer scientists, industrial engineers, and researchers to discuss and exchange experimental or theoretical results, novel designs, work in progress, experience, case study, and trend setting ideas in the area of edge computing and IoT, with emphasis on systems management and security. ICECI 2020 features a nice program with paper sessions and the keynote session. We hope you were enjoying the mix of the result of the conference program. We are extremely fortunate to have two exceptional keynote speakers, Professor Shermanson from the University of Waterloo and Professor Skorang Dastada from the Vienna University of Technology. We thank the EAI for sponsoring the conference. Special thanks to Professor Inrich, who is our steering committee chair. Thanks to Christina, who is our conference manager. Without their strong support, this conference event would not be possible. We hope you will enjoy the EAI ICECI 2020 and have a nice time.
Dear ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to the EAI ICECI 2020, the International Conference on the Edge Computing and IoT Systems Management and Security. My name is Kristina Petrovičeva and I'm the Conference Manager of ICECI 2020. Unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 emergency, I'm not able to meet you all in person. Therefore, I'm using this opportunity to address the organizing committee, the keynote speakers, the authors and participants on behalf of European Alliance for Innovation. Thank you for being part of this conference. In particular, I would like to thank the General Chair, Professor Hong Boyang from Hunan University in China, together with the whole organizing committee for their hard and excellent work throughout the whole process of the conference preparation. During today's event, there are truly many ways how you can actively participate and enjoy the online interaction. During the streaming, there is a Slack platform available for all the participants where you can discuss the presentations and participate in Q&A sessions. Upon receiving the link below for ICECI 2020 workspace, you can enter all channels which are divided into sessions. Moreover, you can vote on individual presentations and leave your fellow presenters feedback via EAI Compass. In a moment, we will show you how to access these platforms and make the most of this unique online experience. I would also like to use this opportunity to invite you to join us for the next edition of ICECI in 2021. We will keep you updated and the news about this event will be available on the conference website. Should you be interested in becoming a part of the next year edition organizing committee or the technical program committee, please do not hesitate to contact me at my email address below. In addition, if you are interested in organizing an event with EAI, such as a conference, a workshop or a seminar, please do not hesitate to contact me at my email address as well. I will be happy to provide you with more information. Now, our community manager Michal will talk more about what EAI does, who we are and how you can get involved in our various activities. Thank you for your attention. Enjoy this conference. Hi everyone, my name is Michal Dudic. I'm the Community Manager at EEI, European Alliance for Innovation. It's my pleasure to welcome you at this conference uh, and say a few words about who we are and what we can do for you and your research career. In short, EEI is a global community for a greener, healthier and smarter world. As of today, we are home to more than 60,000 members from 167 countries and we reach out to tens of thousands of subscribers. As an organization, we are nonprofit from day one, and what is most important to us is that we remain open to all researchers from all around the world thanks to membership that is completely free. We organize more than 100 events annually, such as this conference, and we do so in publishing partnership with Springer. I said in the beginning that EAI is a community, so let's talk about what that means and what it means for you. To put it briefly, we give our members a platform that builds their research. We do it with three main online community services where members come together to help each other write a better paper, get an objective review and get recognized fairly. The three services in question are EAI Compass, Community Review and EAI Index. Firstly. EAI Compass is an online app where you can meet and connect with new colleagues and get feedback on your paper as well as your presentation. In addition to that, it lets you download all full papers that will be presented at this conference and you can vote on your favorite presentations as well as see everyone who is here and connect with them. You can do this right now if you go to EAI Compass website, compass.eai.eu. Next, we are improving the classic conference review process with community review. It has already been in use at all our events since 2019 and we were very excited to hear a lot of positive feedback from program committee members regarding the reliability and the speed of the community review. Let's talk briefly about what community review does. Essentially, it is a website that shows abstracts of papers that are right in the middle of the review process, as long as the authors allow it, of course. 
and all EAI members may then bid to review specific papers. When they submit their bid, they put in their bio and their qualifications, which are sent to the program committee, who can then decide whether or not this bidder is qualified to review the paper they bid on. This relatively easy access to review opportunities means that bidders really need to put their best foot forward if they wish to be selected, which improves the quality of the entire review process. At the end of the day, this benefits you, the author. And last but not least, let me tell you a thing or two about EAI Index. EAI Index is our credit-based evaluation system that we rolled out this year to all of our conferences and journals that allow you to climb the global ranks of EAI community and get recognized for your work. It calculates a number of value for most actions you make, such as getting your paper accepted or submitting a review, and these numbers accumulate for 12 months. At the end of this 12-month period, we put together a ladder of all EAI members and the ones at the top receive a nomination to one of the membership ranks – senior member, distinguished member or fellow. For each action that is eligible for EAI index credits, we will look at the quality of your action as it was evaluated by another member of the community, such as, for example, the review score of your submission. To make sure that the system is fair to newcomers, every 12 months the credit count gets erased, the ones at the top receive their nominations, and every member starts at zero for the following 12 months. And finally, Smart Submit is a collaboration feature that is coming later this year. It will allow you to submit your research ideas and your work in progress abstracts to get the kind of help and feedback you're looking for. Maybe you are looking for co-authors, maybe you would like to find a mentor or a mentee, or maybe you want to find out how the community feels about your idea. This is what Smart Submit is designed for. Ultimately, it's about helping you write a better paper and increasing your chances of getting accepted. Again, we will be launching this feature later this year, so stay tuned. And so I'm going to leave you with many different ways to get engaged at different levels. There are lots of opportunities in many of our events and publications, which means many ways to connect with people and collaborate. You may learn more about everything I just talked about at our website, eai.eu. These services exist to help you and to make your lives easier, so we encourage you to send us your comments, ideas, and feedback to community at eai.eu. And if you're interested in volunteering and contributing, you can let us know at the same email address. Don't forget that you can use EAI Compass to vote on presentations in real time to determine which ones are the best, as well as to download all full papers that will be presented today. Just make sure that you log in using the same email address as the one you used to register to this conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please enjoy the conference and I hope we will see everyone online soon.
Hello, everyone. My name is Xiaoming Shen from the University of Waterloo, Canada. Today, I'm going to give a talk on reinforcement learning for resource management in space, air, ground, integrated vehicular network. It is well known the main concerns of the current transportation system are safety, congestion, and the environment. For safety, global road traffic crashes account for 1.2 million deaths per year, top the cost of deaths for ages 15 to 29, and 3% of GDP loss for low middle income countries. For congestion, commuters waste 8 billion hours in traffic per year and $160 billion loss due to urban congestion. For environment, wasted fuel is topped 3 billion gallons in addition to 56 billion pounds of CO2. To address those challenges, the potential solution is the connected vehicles. Vehicular communications networks have attracted a lot of attention recently, not only from the academia, industry, but also governments due to its significant impact to our daily life. V2X means to make vehicle exchange information with everything, including vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to pedestrian, vehicle to cloud, vehicle to sensor, etc. With the V2X, information such as vehicle speed, location, road conditions, etc., can be exchanged among neighboring vehicles so that road safety can be significantly enhanced since drivers can get early warning so potential vehicle collisions could be avoided. In addition, congestions can be relieved due to better traffic management, such as traffic light control, street light management, intersection movement assist. Transportation systems become more environmental friendly since vehicles spend less amount of time on the road so that less CO2 emissions will be released. Furthermore, V2X can bring Many other applications, such as smart parking, on-road entertainment, EV charging management, location-based services. However, the challenges are V2X communications require a lot of wireless resource due to large amount of data traffic. This is because V2X communication is a typical heterogeneous machine and human type coexisting communications. Currently, each vehicle has about 50 to 100 sensors, and this number is expected to be doubled in the near future. The data traffic generated by the sensors is about 750 megabits per second. In addition, human type traffic data keep increasing due to the requirement of on-road infotainment and the location-based services. In addition, the vehicle high mobility and the unreliable channels make it difficult to satisfy the strict quality of service requirements of different vehicular services. In addition, 
some human driving behavior, such as fatigue drivings, distracted drivings, under influence driving, aggressive driving, are very difficult to be managed. Therefore, recently, automated driving has attracted a lot of attention. That is using machine to replace human to drive vehicle. From a system point of view, for human driving, the input of driving system is the information of road environment obtained through eye observation. Then the driver takes actions based on the observations, the driver's driving skills and experience to control the car, including speed, braking, and the steering, etc. For automated driving, the road environment observation is conducted through high technologies such as camera, Linda, sensors, etc. In addition, the collected driving behavior data, GPS, and the high dimensional maps with the observations are used for the machine computer to make automated driving decision. Although the automated driving related technologies has been highly developed, automated driving still face challenges from the technical, legal, and the marketing aspects. First, hardware limitations. The detections of radar, Linda, and the optical cameras have their own constraints in terms of range, sight, and the weather conditions. For example, the camera cannot work if the sight is blocked by a truck ahead. Second, software reliability. Due to the hardware constraints, such as the CPU and the storage, the processing capability of the automated driving is constrained. In complex situations, the software may crash and cause huge loss. Also, the processing capability is constrained by the training data and the experiences. In special cases, the software may fail and make wrong decisions. For example, it cannot detect and deal with the temporal constructions not posted on map or database. In addition, software may also be attacked by hackers causing security and the privacy issues. Third, the automated vehicles also face other issues such as legal and the marketing problem. High price, as the automated vehicles require advanced hardware embedded, like laser radar, uh, HD 3D camera, the automated vehicle will be much more expensive than conventional vehicles. Also, people who like to drive for fun may lose their hobby, while people who drive for work may lose their job. In addition, government may have lots of work to regulate the automated driving, including detailed liability when accident happens. Since the automated driving mainly depends on the computer vision to learn the driving environment, there are also many challenges due to confusion, traffic lights, bad weather, fading lanes, etc. Those challenges can be overcome through V2X, since vehicles can get the global information of traffic 
and make global optimization together through vehicle cooperation. This can greatly improve sensing ability, accuracy, reliability, as well as traffic efficiency. In other words, V2X communications can help to make automated driving safer and easier. On the other hand, sensing intelligence can help to reduce the V2S communications workload, enhance communications reliability and efficiency. Since automated driving vehicles can obtain a lot of information locally, which can significantly reduce a lot of V2X information exchange. In addition, local message sensing is more reliable due to less transmission delay and the potential communication attacks. With less message sharing, the privacy can be better protected. Also, automated driving is more regulated and can be controlled. Therefore, if the engineers and the researchers from both V2X and the computer vision can work together. The automated driving based on communications, computings, and the sensing will become safer, more convenient, clean, and a better cooperation. The Society of Automotive Engineers of America has proposed the sixth level of automated driving. In level zero, there is no automation. The human driver performs driving all the time. In both level one and the level two, the human driver are required to monitor the driving environment and the driving assistant system acts passively. In level three, four, and five, the automated driving system monitors driving environment and the driving assistant system acts actively. Currently, most research and the development are on the level three and the level four self-driving. There is still a long way to achieve level five self-driving or full automation. To achieve level five self-driving, there is a long way to go. This is because full automation requires seamless network coverage for service continuity. In addition, robust flexible resource management is required in order to ensure sufficient resources during rush hours and uh, special events. This slide shows two maps. One is a Canadian map, one is a China map. The challenging is that the network coverage is very insufficient. From those two maps, the areas with color indicates that there is network coverage. We can see that in Canada, the network coverage is only about 20%. And in China, it's less than 40%. This is due to many reasons, such as the cost, offshore, mountain, etc. Also, the vehicle traffic depends on time, such as rush hours, location, such as downtown area, special events, etc. The solution for the future full automation vehicle is 
the space air ground integrated network. The uh, space air ground integrate vehicle network means to integrate the satellite area network and the ground network to provide any vehicle anywhere, anytime communications. Our objective is to build a space air ground integrate vehicle network, which is responsible to enhance the coverage and the vehicle mobility. One, the UAV or the drone can form moving cells to keep pace with the movement of the vehicles to provide flexible capacity for special event uh, during rush hour. Satellite is responsible for location and the navigation and also covers the area without ground network access. This slide shows some commercialized equipment for satellite with vehicle communications. Also, different industries around the world, in China, US, UK, have put a lot of efforts to achieve the air and the ground network integrations. The main issue related to the space air assisted networking is how to make efficient use of different networks resources to support services with a different QS requirements. This figure shows our proposed hybrid and hierarchical control architecture of the space air ground vehicle network. Hybrid means satellite, UAV, and the ground network for urban and remote areas. Hierarchical control means local access control plus central resource allocation control. With this architecture, the local controller collect the individual vehicle service requirements through the roadside units and the available ground network resource. It passes the information to the central controller. The central controller makes the resource allocation to support individual vehicle services with satisfied QS requirement based on the overall available network resource from satellite UAV and the ground networks. We propose to use SDN controller for resource management in space air ground vehicle network. The SDN controller enables network slicing of virtual networks so that different SAG VN services with diversified QS requirements can be effectively supported in the independent virtual networks on the top of a shared physical network infrastructure. For the SDN controller, there are two inputs. One is from the demand side. One is from the available resource side. The SDN controller makes the decision what type of resource and how much of it will be used to which service. Due to the high dynamics of service demand and the available resources, this decision is based on the reinforcement learning. For reinforcement learning, an agent 
in this case, network controller learns the best policy through interaction with the unknown network system environment. At each system state, for example, UAV location, the agent takes an action, observes the reward, for example, pass log uh, throughput from the environment to know how good this action is and adjust its future action based on the reward. Therefore, reinforcement learning learns the best policy, that is, which action should be taken at each system state for resource management. We have developed reinforcement learning based SDN controller to efficiently manage SAG resources by interaction with environments, the decision map of the SDN controller can be obtained offline. In this way, the resource allocation decision can be done in real time according to different service requirements, which is very suitable for vehicular scenarios. With the SDN controller, we can do adaptive access control, which means for a vehicle on the road with a service requirement, the controller can decide which resource will be used to support its service requirement. The SDN controller can also decide the number of UAVs needed and each UAV's trajectory in order to maximize the UAV coverage ratio and the network throughput. In the following, I'm going to present the space air ground vehicle network simulation platform. Currently, there are available software for space, air, and the ground network simulations. For example, STK is a software package to perform complex analysis of space platform. VSIM is an advanced and a flexible traffic simulation software with complex vehicle interactions, mobility, traffic planning. However, there is no simulation platform supporting the integration of space air ground vehicle network functions. Since this platform is urgently needed to promote the research and the development of space air ground vehicle network, we use related simulation software to build the platform. In specific, VSIM and ASTK are used to generate the physical object, location, and the mobility on network nodes, including satellite, UAVs, and the vehicles. Network Simulator 3, or NS3, runs the car simulation. And the Panther and the MATLAB are used to develop interface to further extend the capability of the platform. Here is an example from the simulation platform. We choose University of Waterloo campus as the simulation area by selecting a testing vehicle. The SDN controller can decide which resource and how much of the resource will be used to support the vehicle based on the available resource number of vehicles on the road and their service requirements. This is an example of the access control 
from the simulation platform. In this scenario, the SR control is performed to maximize the achievable network throughput of the testing vehicle. It can be seen in the animation with multi-dimensional mobility introduced by vehicles, UAVs, and the satellites. The testing vehicle can be served by different network resources at the different times with a time varying achievable throughput. In the following, I'm going to introduce the SDK system toolkit simulation tool to simulate the satellite complications. Originally created to simulate Earth's orbi uh, orbiting satellites, SDK provides highly comp uh, comprehensive parameters and the data of existing LEO, median Earth orbit, or uh, male, and the uh, geo satellite systems. SDK can be utilized for data analysis, and it also provides visualization tools. We can also configure the satellite simulation scenario and the corresponding communication parameters, including power, antenna gain, path loss, et cetera, in SDK. Notice that for the satellite orbiting information and the locations of satellite ground stations, we can either import from the existing database or customize them by ourselves. The simulation results from SDK include access time, signal to noise ratio, bit error rate, etc., that can be obtained with the built in analysis tools. In this slide, by setting up the different simulation scenarios, we can observe the satellite access time and the communication performance in terms of signal to noise ratio and the BER. The satellite access time refers to the time duration within which the satellite can establish communication links with the ground users. The access time depends on the orbit of the satellite. In this slide, the two figures show the BR performance comparison between LEO satellites and the male satellites. It can be seen that male satellites have larger access time due to the height, while LEO satellites have better communication performance in terms of BR since it close to the ground. We simulate two Beidou medium orbit satellites and one Beidou inclined orbit satellite. The simulation results shows the individual satellite access time. By considering all three satellites together, the overall access time in a given location is more than 90%. In this slide, we demonstrate the development of UAVs to support vehicle users in a dense scenario. The SDN controller decides how many UAVs are needed, which trajectory each UAV should follow for a given scenario. In the figure, there are five UAVs. The left figure is the 3D view and the right figure is the corresponding bird's eye view. The small squares represent the vehicles, the solid circles represent the UAVs, and the 
black triangle is the base station. Vehicles with different colors are served by different UAVs according to their service requirements. This figure shows the animation of the five UAVs trajectory. Here are some parameters and the scenarios considered in the simulation. Here are some related work from our research group. In the first work, we present a network slicing based network architecture for the next generation wireless network the motivation research challenging and the potential future direction related to applying AI-based approaches in the next generation wireless networks are described in details. In the second work, we propose SDN-based space air ground vehicle network control framework where a hybrid and a hierarchical SAGVN control architecture is proposed to manage the resources, including communication, caching, and uh, computing from different network segments. Furthermore, AI is utilized to design resource management algorithm to address the difficulty in system modeling and the enhanced resource management efficiency. Now, in the third work, we present our developed SAG VN simulation platform, which supports the space area and the terrestrial network and the communication functions to facilitate efficient network management in the uh, SAG VN centralized and the decentralized controllers are uh, implemented to optimize the network functions such as access control and the resource orchestration. In addition, Various interfaces enable flexible functionality extension in the platform to facilitate user-defined mobility choices and the control algorithms. In conclusion, space air ground integrated vehicle networks can support diverse vehicle services efficiently and the cost effectively anywhere and anytime. The presented network architecture can achieve network agility and the flexibility and the simplified network management. There have been significant efforts in the development of SAGVN. How to efficiently and effectively Orchestrate communication, computing, caching, and the control resource is a very important research subject. In addition, more attention should be paid for vehicle services, which require different security goals, such as authentication, confidentiality, and the integrity. Thank you.
Hello everyone, I will introduce our research work on ID computing, smart diff, schedule and offload uh, concur concurrent tasks under the constraints of ID, bandwidth and computing resources. We have entered an area of big data. Enterprises want to develop competitive advantage via big data analytics. With the right big data analytics in place, an enterprise can reduce cost via more efficient operations, make faster and better future decisions, always give the customers what they really want. 
The figure describes an AG network environment, which is composed of a terminal access point and uh, several AG computing slots. Terminals upload the data to the AG cluster through the AP. It is easy to see that the upload link bandwidth of the AP is the bottleneck. Obviously, the completion time of a job depends on its regular task, so providing services for certain tasks is wasting resources because their brother tasks on other edges are being delayed. Unluckily, shuffling and uh, offloading tasks on the fly across sites actually face, faces large challenges. First, the system environments are often highly uh, dynamic and uncertain. Uh, for instance, the job arrivals are unknown ahead of time. The task duration can also be unpredictable. Therefore, it is difficult to devise online decision-making algorithms. Second, the AD results are limited where the amount of raw data is huge. The algorithm's design should try to avoid uh, wasting resources. Third, sites are highly heterogeneous. The algorithms should not only determine the uploading order for text, but also consider where the tasks are deployed and uh, when they are ex executed. We define the problem as task uploading and result sharing for geo distributed jobs. Since the offload occurs after the data upload is completed, we naturally divide the geo task into two problems as follows. There are two decisions in this picture. First, determine upload order for jobs. Second, slot selection and task scheduling on the slot. There are some symbols. For example, set the uplink bandwidth of the AP to BP. RJ is the arrival time of job G. D, PJS is the processing time of the task on slot S. Before the task U performs data pro processing, data needs to be uploaded from the uh, terminal device to the ID cluster. Let TPJ be the data upload completion time, just as the formula says. Among them, WN is the time that the data of the task is, is queued up at the access point P to be uploaded. Based on the aforementioned models, we formulated the problem. The problem can be proven to be NP hat. Among them, TJ is the data uploading completion time of job J. And uh, Constraint 3.6 indicates that the task data is uploaded in strict order and uh, no preemption is allowed. Among them, WC is the queen delay of the task on the server as light CJ. Uh, represent the completion time of the job J. For these jobs uh, executed on multiple edges, this paper coordinates the data upload order of tasks. The decision of the slot where the task is uploaded and the scheduling execution order on the slot to minimize the sum of the completion time. 
Based on the aforementioned models, we formulated the problem. The problem can be proven to be NP-hat. Among them, the constraint uh, 3.8 ensures that a task can and must be offloaded to a slot. Constraint 3.11 shows that the task execution uh, strictly follows the determined scheduling and the preemption is not allowed. The algorithm's brief overview is that when a distributed execution job is released, SmartDS first arranges upload order for the job at uh, H8AP based on the primary dual method to minimize the global data transmission delay. When the data upload of a certain task is completed, SmartDS immediately selects the offload slot for the task based on the principle of the smallest value added of the sum of the completion time and arranges the scheduling execution order for tax on the slot. Step 1. Determine upload order for jobs. There are two facts. The completion time of a job depends on its straggler task. Second, providing services for certain tasks is wasting resources because their brother tasks on other edges are being delayed. So, the principle is that the resources of straggler tasks, brother tasks are saved for other jobs. Mm, and this is the specific algorithm. Step 2. Slot selection and task scheduling on the slot. First, slot selection. The principle is, when you offload the task to a certain slot, the increase in the sum of delays in the completion of the job should be minimal. And the increase in the overall job completion time is composed of three paths as follows. For single task jobs, the SRPT scheduling strategy is optimal. Based on SRPT and considering the multiple task job distributed execution mode. This paper designs JEO SRPT scheduling strategy. And uh, this is the specific algorithm. There are two primary theoretical results. First, the JEO uh, TONIS problem is an NP hard problem. Second, if the order uh, generated by the order algorithms is used, the set term upload time will not exceed three times the optimal time. To evaluate SmartDS on a larger scale, we conduct uh, simulations. We modify the cloud theme simu simulator to run our simulations. Uh, we compare SmartDS to FSFC Global SRPT, Independent SRPT, Reordering, and uh, SWAG. For job response time, SmartDS performs best in all local conditions. In the SmartDS 
a shuttling mode. The big jobs have a low latency compared to other algorithms. The figure presents the general trend that as the data skewness increases, the performance of the scheduling algorithm increases first and then uh, decreases. The figure shows that with the increase in AD scale uh, heterogeneity, SmartDS performance has always maintained an uh, advantage. And compared with other scheduling algorithms, SmartDS is more sensitive to changes in AD scale differences. The experiment studies the effect of the system size on the performance of the shuffling algorithm in the figure. As the number of edges increases, the performance of row ordering, step AD and smart edges all show an increasing trend. The figure shows that with the increase in the accuracy of task duration estimation, the performance of each scheduling algorithm will be slightly improved, but it is not obvious. The experiment measures the length of time to run the scheduling algorithm at each scheduling decision point. The figure shows the running time of the scheduling algorithm under different system uh, utilization rates, FCFS, global SRPT, and uh, independent SRPT are not shown in the results due to their uh, minimal running time compared to other algorithms. The transmission and the processing of large amounts of raw data put pressure on the ID network. Besides, uh, the bandwidth and the computing resource of ID is limited, therefore. This paper proposed SmartDIS a uh, scheduling uh, algorithm to arrange the order for data upload requirements and the order of execution for data processing requirements. Faced with IG servers at the same time, SmartDisk selects all flowed uh, slots for tasks based on the principle of the smallest sum of added value of the overall completion time. Theoretically, it can be uh, proved that if the data upload is completed according to the order set by SmartDisk, the system transmission time will not exceed 3 times the optimal time. The evaluation results of simulation experiments show that SmartDisk is uh, superior to any other uh, algorithm at this stage. My presentation is over. Thank you for your listening.
Hello everyone, my name is Li Hao from Nanjing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics in China. I'm honored to have been invited to speak at this conference. The topic of my paper is Energy Efficient Service Composition with Delay Guarantee in a Cloud Edge System. As the PPT shows, my presentation is mainly divided into four parts, introduction, problem analysis, performance evolution, and uh, conclusion. Firstly, I would like to introduce the background of our research. With the development of the Internet of Things and uh, wireless communication technology, the data volume grows quickly. This situation poses a huge challenge to the currently widely used cloud computing. Although the traditional cloud data center can provide a powerful data analysis capability, the large volume of data transmission from the mobile users too far away from data center results in long service delay. And mobile devices are energy aware. Long service delay actually increases the energy consumption. So deploying service on the edges nearby is a promising way to reduce the service delay. However, in a cloud edge system, many edges are resource limited and only suitable for running certain service components to achieve a comprehensive requirement from the user. Several service components need to be composed into a composite service. On the other hand, since the resource limitation, edges are usually unstable. With the workload growth, the response time of edge increases or could or even could not get a response. So above the content is our research background. We can summarize the following three points. The energy aware devices, resource limited and unstable edges. Then we introduce our research scenario according to the research background. For a typical cloud edge system, it consists of a terminal layer, edge computing layer, and a cloud com cloud computing layer. It is feasible to performance interlayer and cross-layer communication through the network for each layer. In a cloud edge system, we can accelerate service through service components clone via different edges. So how to select the service components with limitation to reduce the energy consumption of mobile devices due to budget constraint? We try to minimize the overall composite service response time to reduce the energy consumption of mobile devices. Our main idea is to clone some service components and construct more than one service path to guarantee the response time with limited clone constraints. Secondly, I would like to introduce the system model and formalize the service composition problem and then introduce the energy efficient service composition algorithm. We use the service path to represent the construction of a composite service represented by Fi. As the PPT shows, it is an example of a service path. This composite service requires four service components to achieve a comprehensive requirement from the user. For each service component, several duplicated instances may be deployed in different edges. The number above the service component indicates the number instance of the service component. The service instance is the service entity of each service component which is described by four attributes. Pause represents the location of the service instance, and there are two options, cloud data center or edge node. RA represents the ratio of the amount of input and output data of the service instance, or 
represents the time that service instance spends processing unit data. E represents the effectiveness of the service, where whether it's valuable or not. The problem is to select some instance to form a composite service in the cloud edge system. The most noteworthy problem is that the edges have limited resource and the performance is unstable, which is different from the cloud data center with stable performance. Meanwhile, the network status between edge nodes and the cloud data center is unstable. If only one instance chain is selected for a composite service, we cannot guarantee the response time. If an agent is unable to respond due to limited resources or network communication terminals, it will increase both service delay and energy consumption because the service acquisition is very energy intensive. For this problem, the first thing is to ensure that multiple chains are selected to complete a certain composition of task to pre pre prevent the above situation. For the selected multiple chains, their constructor may have intersections or complete, completely independent from each other, and they can they can be exited at the same time. Before introducing our algorithm, let's first introduce how to define the delay of a service chain. The delay consists of processing data time and transmitting data time. M0 represents the initial amount of data and S0. X represents the number of the corresponding instances in each service class. MRX is the amount of data getting to a current service SIX. MRX multiply RIX indicates the amount of data to be transferred to the subsequent service. BIG indicates the bandwidth of the data transmission. According to our equation, Omega IJ represents the comprehensive performance of the network environment where a service is located and the data transmitting capability of the service. It is mentioned above that for each service instance of a specific chain, it is a constant chain volume and M0 and O0 are non-constants. Therefore, in initiative form, to make to make the total delay of selected instance chain as small as possible, it is necessary to make omega ig as small as possible. Now we propose an energy efficient data well service composition algorithm. In fact, from the perspective of the algorithm acquisition process, there are also graded algorithms and random algorithm ideas. Where when you want to select the next service instance, first check whether there is one in the same place at the previous instance, both in the cloud data center or the same each node from the candidate set. If there is one, it is preferred. If there is no such instance in the current candidate set, or because of some limiting factors, there is the some location at the previous instance, but the instance cannot be selected. The gradient algorithm is used to select the better one from the remaining instance. Rank in the first line of the algorithm means that the current candidate instance set is sought from small to large according to its omega ig. Prepose is the location of previous instance. Find some pulse is to find the sum instance sequence number in the candidate set as the pre node position and return the instance number if there is one. Line 9 means that the current candidate set 
has the same instance at, as the pre node position. However, due to uh, uh, conditional constraints, it's not possible to select an instance. Then, randomly select the first 50% of the set of instances in the instance set that uh, have already sought the omega ij. Okay, now we move to the part of the experiment. This section mainly introduces comparative ex experimental methods, process, and uh, corresponding res results display and uh, analysis instructions. The purpose of the experiment is to compare the performance of three service composition algorithms, include a random algorithm, a graded algorithm, and a dataware service composition algorithm. Under the same constraints and experimental scenario settings, the main factors that affect the delay of instance chain set include the number of optional service instance chains and the total number of optional service instances. For the first set of experiments, we adjust the number of optional service instance chains. When the number of the instance chains is 3 and 5, the performance of the proposed algorithm is obviously better than the others. The surface delay of the proposed algorithm is short, thus reducing the energy consumption of mobile devices. As the number of instance chains increase, the difference between algorithms be become more stable, and the performance of each algorithm become better and closer. However, in a real cloud age system, it is impossible to allow a service composition algorithm to select a large number of instance chains because the results are at, at the edge are limited. For the second set of experiments, we adjust the total number of instances. As the total number of instances changes, the proposed algorithm is always better than the traditional algorithms in reducing service delay which means that the proposed algorithm reduced the energy consumption of mobile devices. At the same time, the performance difference between the three selection algorithms does not change significantly as the number of optional instances increase. Because in most cases, the three selection algorithms do not require many chains to select the specific number of instances. Therefore, the proposed algorithm reduces service delay, and it also reduces the waiting time of applications on mobile devices and the age consumption of mobile devices. Now, we come to the last part, conclusion. In this paper, we investigate the service composition problem and uh, propose an energy efficient dataware service composition algorithm, which is a new extension of service composition in a cloud edge system. To handle the uncertainty of a single service, we propose an effective service instance selection mechanism to generate multiple service passes to reduce service delay and uh, energy consumption of mobile devices. Extensive simulation, simulations show that the proposed service composition algorithm can achieve a good performance in reducing the response time compared with the random algorithm and uh, the greedy algorithm. That's all for my presentation. Once again, I would like to say thank you for the privilege and the opportunity of talking to you about this subject. Thank you very much.
Hello everyone, my name is Drisa Kamisoko. I am a PhD student at the Department of Computer Science and Electronics Engineering from Hunan University. I am pleased to join this conference and I have been appointed to present you our work about characterization of OFDM based free space optical transmission system under heavy rain weather. For introduction, generally used as an alternative to radio over fiber system, FSO is a wireless line of sight technology that uses invisible beam of light to transmit optical bandwidth connections. F but FSO links are subject to severe attenuation due to atmospheric conditions like rain, which can degrade their performance. OFDM is a, is a high spectrally efficient modulation technique that can resist to strong turbulence and achieve very high speed transmission as the data is distributed over a large number of orthogonal subcarriers. Therefore, an FSO system incorporating the OFDM data format is currently prone to be a relevant solution for the 5G backhole and front hole transmission. The FSO channel characteristics. To design a high performance communication links for, for the atmospheric FSO channel, it is a great importance to characterize the channel with proper model. 
The maximum achievable link distance can be determined based on the rain attenuation model and the received power level. We can also evaluate the impact of the beam divergence on the signal received after the FSO channel. The received optical power. Considering a single mode Gaussian beam of small divergence angle theta, the received power PRX is a function depending on the total transmit power, the aperture of the receive area, and the link distance. So we can see here the power received on the aperture of the receiver is inversely proportional to the square of the of the divergence angle and the, the distance and the link distance. And there is a small term which corresponds to the optical efficiency, the combined effect of optical efficiency of the transmitter and the receiver devices. And the alpha is the, the attenuation, atmospheric attenuation coefficient. The FSO channel characteristics. When we transmit a, a, a light beam through the space, due to, due to the beam propagation characteristics, the receiver, the receiver can only get a certain amount of the transmit power and this amount is expressed in the formula we have seen. As the laser, as the laser beam divergence is a direct function of the link range, it can be derived from the equation 1. And this is it. We derive this from the equation 1. The impact factor of the beam divergence can be measured by taking out the following term from equation 2. And this is the impact of beam divergence. The rain attenuation model. The rain attenuation is independent of the frequency of or the wavelength but theoretically related to the length distance to the theoretically related to the raindrop size distribution fi in this formula for a certain location and a link distance fi can be given by the statistical data of the of the rainfall rate as in this formula so we can see that the rain the raindrop size distribution is depending on the on the rainfall rate with a using a a small term r is the diameter of the received area and here this term or the rainfall rate can be strictly measured on the field on the field and uh, make a statistical data with it which we have used then the rain attenuation can be generally derived as a function of the rainfall rate using equation four and five and here we see there is a the attenuation is only depending on the rainfall rate with the two parameters which is called power law parameters alpha and beta so the system investigated the system model investigated for our simulation setup we have used the opti opti system software opti system simulation software uh, this software is suitable for to simulate optical links and uh, for our simulation setup we have built a system composed mainly by two main components, which is the external Max Zender modulator at the transmitter and the single photodiode at the receiver side. At the transmitter side, the 64 quam of DM data is uh, modulate the laser frequency to be transmitted over the FSO channel. But before transmission, we boost the signal 
using a 20 dB optical amplifier. And the, at, at the receiver before the photodiode, we we use an, an gain amplifier to to improve to improve the signal level for the direct detection. And after the direct detection, the electrical signal is bandpass filters to get the pure transmitted baseband data. In this, it, in this study, the rainfall data of Segu weather from 12 to 20, 2012 to 2016 is studied. Using the rainfall data reported as recorded in the climate and weather information system, the maximum rain, rainfall rate within the selected period is considered. The carbon rain attenuation model is adopted to analyze the performance of the 64 gram FSO links. The power law parameters value are 1.076 and 0.67 respectively. And in this table, we have seen how we have set the observation, observation period goes from 2012 to 2016 and the maximum data the maximum rain intensity observed was observed on the 20th, 20th of July 2016 and this value was 79.99 and when we calculate the corresponding attenuation it gave us 21 dB by kilometer. For our simulations, for our simulation first we want to see the effect of the variation of the beam divergence on the Q factor. And here we obtain this curve, which is a decreasing curve of the, by when the beam divergence increase, the quality decreases. So, the, which means that an increasing in beam, beam divergence angle the greater the beam divergence angle, the poorer the link distance. And after we choose two, we, we alternately choose two different value from the beam divergence and we plot the, the variation of the Q factor with the noise. This means that in OptiSystem software, we, we try to add gradually add a certain amount of noise on the system and we measure the corresponding Q factor level. And for this, we can observe that a great variation in the OSNR can increase the Q factor but very, very slightly. For example, for the 40 the, the 4 millirad beam divergence value we have vary from 5 db to 60 db and this variation can only increase the q factor from uh, up to from 15.5 to 15 to i mean 16.2 so less than 1 db and it is the same with the, the 2 millirad so we can say that a great variation in OSNR introduces only a slight increase in the link quality. And uh, after we want to see, to see the variation, we want to see the maximum achievable distance by increasing the power, the launch power. So we try to gradually increase the power and uh, up to 30 dB and for the end, uh, always we measure the corresponding distance. And for this, we, we observe that the variation is a slope, a straight slope, increasing slope of the distance. And we have obtained for the four milliards a, a launch power of 20, 30 dBm can get we can get 1.6 1.6 kilometer 
and for the two milliard we can get up to 1.9 kilometer distance so after now we want to see the quality of the received data for this we ver we vary we, we we have choose the evm parameter to see this quality and uh, it's a good parameter to see the quality of the uh, received data and uh, by varying the launch power from 0 dbm to 20 dbm we have obtained this curve with our two value of beam divergence and uh, we observe that the evm the, the 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 obtained graph is under the evm threshold for the 64 quam data for data format so we can say that in our proposed system up to 30 dbm launch power can be supported under the evm threshold for the selected for both selected angle values and power value and uh, to better investigate the quality of the received data we have plotted the received cancellation of the 60 quam of the data and we see that these two graphs are enough clear which means that the received cancellation are clear and the, the data is pure for the simulation comments result comments the obtained graphs prove that the link can be can tolerate more attenuation by decreasing the divergence angle and the of them format are selected and the of them format are less affected in the FSO channel regardless of the raindrop size considering the carbono rain attenuation model we have sent 42 gbps of them data uh, up to 1.9 kilometer under the worst rain rain condition for the considered location in conclusion in this paper a 64 of them quam format were proposed for the fso communication system under heavy rain weather in segu mali the, the performance of the of them FSO system based on the Carbono model was assessed. The effect of the beam divergence was also analyzed and the result revealed that the quality of the receive the reception decreases on the high high broadening of FSO transmitter light beam. Up to 1.9 kilometer transmit kilometer distance distance is achievable using appropriate system parameters and this is the end thank you so much
Hello everyone. Today I'm very glad to print my paper. TouchSense, accurate and transparent user reauthentication via finger touching. My name is Tong Zhang. I'm come from University of Electronic Science and Technology of China. The development of smartphones brings convenience to our daily lives. People can use smartphones to taking photo, sending email, and even playing games. In last year, the global smartphone shipments is up to 369 million devices around the world. It brings convenience to our daily lives, but also privacy security issues, as smartphones may contain much of the personal privacy data in it, such as the user's photo, credit card number, email, and even home locations. If the smartphone is lost or stolen by a thief, those private data are vulnerable to the attackers. To protect the private data, most smartphones have deployed traditional authentication schemes, such as password, fingerprint, face, and erase. Those schemes are based on the user's memory and biometrics. It is stable. Because the password and the fingerprint will not change itself, but it requires user assistance in sensing. To collect the data of fingerprint, the user has to stop his interaction and put his finger on the fingerprint sensor. So it can only work for critical operations, such as unlocking and paying, and cannot secure smartphones for the full usage. Because the authentication progress will interrupt user interactions and lead to bad user experience. To make up the flaw of user authentication, many papers are studied on user reauthentication, which repeatedly authenticate users when using. To not bother users in using, the data should be transparently sensed without user assistance. So those schemes are mainly based on the user's behavioral habits, such as the user's touching habit, typing habit, and walking habit. Those schemes can work in when the user is using. However, the stability and the robustness is poor. As those scams will be influenced by different buggy conditions and different apps. For example, some apps need users to long press the screen to copy text or short screen. It changes the user's behavior and may lead to misjudgment and low accuracy. Now we just wonder, can we find a new feature for user reauthentication which is stable and transparent? Stable means accurate. Transparent means the data can be imperceptibly sensed during using. We found human biometric capacitance. This is the capability of the human body to store charges and can be transparently sensed during screen touching. You may just wonder why this feature not be deployed on smartphones for user reauthentication now. The reason comes from the fact that this feature cannot be accurately sensed in mobile scenarios. The accurate measurement of biometric capacitance requires the user to stand in with bare feet in a phallic shield, which is not practical in mobile scenarios. To improve the accuracy, our solution is combine it with the touching behavior. When the user touches the screen, his finger and the sensor under the screen will generate a capacitor, which value is proportional to the human biometric capacitance of the user, and reversed proportional to the distance between the finger and the screen. When the user touches the screen, this distance changes over time, and result in the change of the sensed biometric capacitance. Just shown in the figure, so the change of the curve related to the user's touching behavior, and the peak of the curve related to the user's human biometric capacitance. As the distance is fixed, 
and equal to the thickness of the glass. As we discussed in before, the user's behavior may be affected by different apps. In practical, which may only change the holding period of the sensed barometric capacitance. When the user just taps the screen, the holding period will be very short. And if the user need to long press the screen to copy text, the holding period will be extended and change the user's behavior and lead to the misjudgment. So we designed an algorithm to only collect the rising edge and falling edge of the curve and remove the holding period. After that, we faking curve based on the collected data. And we found that the Gaussian function achieves best in curve faking. In Gaussian function, there have three key parameters. The peak of the curve, a basic value of the peak of the curve, and half of the curve. We use the three parameters to build up a three-dimensional user feature vector to represent the user's identity in the current touching. After that, we matching the generated feature vector with the stored value to verify the user's identity in the current touching. We tested the menu of the application algorithms and found that the support vector machine achieves the best result in the training set of Falcon 5, which achieves close to 19% of the accuracy in a single tapping. In support vector machine, it needs a color function to work, and different color function will bring different performance to the support vector machine. We tested the many kernel functions and found that the polynomial kernel achieves best result in the application. So we use the polynomial kernel based support vector machine in the application to match in the generated feature vector with the stored value to verify the user's identity in the current touching. The final step is build up the user's legal commit model based on the authentication results of all the touches during usage to comprehensively evaluate the user's legal commit. The user will get an integral score when logging in, and his score will increase with legal operations or decrease with illegal operations. For the continuous illegal operation, the user's score will deduct extra points to distinguish the attacker and the legal commit users. The user's score will never above the upper bound, and if his score drops below zero, the user will be logged out as an attacker. The expectation of user score can be expressed in this function. P means the probability of user operation to be judged as illegal. X means the deduct points for illegal operations. Y means the bonus points for legal operations. And E means the extra deduct points for continuously illegal operations. S means the upper bound of the score. So for attackers, his score will quickly drop and log out by the system. And for legal commit users, his score will finally close to the upper bound and keeps away from the threshold. So our system can quickly distinguish and log out attackers and hardly influence the normal use of legal commit users. To evaluate the performance of touch sense, we implement our system on a special designed evaluation board, which have high resolution sensing chip for capacitance sensing and ultra low power data pressing chip for data pressing. We can also use a laptop to monitor the working state of touch sense. We can see the change of sensed barometric capacitance in the window real timely. We did comprehensive evaluations on touch sense. We first evaluate the data collection accuracy on 15 users 
For each user, they have 40 to 50 touches in total. The result shows only one user have missed two motions in the detection. The miss of data collection is 0.8% and the data collection accuracy is 99.2% in total. Then, we evaluate the cross-validation for 15 users. For each user, they have their data set for 8 touches. The fourth identification rate of 15 users is only 0.4%. To further evaluate the performance of our system on the defense of attackers, we simulate on a hundred thousand sample of attackers and build up this figure. The false accept rate means the probability of attackers who falsely accepted by our system. We can say the false accept rate is high within five operations. But it drops quickly because in every operation, the attackers have large probability to be logged out by touch sense. And all the attackers have been logged out after 18 operations. So, if an attacker stole a phone which deployed touch sense, even he knows the password and he just want to steal one US dollar through e-bank payment, he has only 0.064% to succeed. To evaluate the influence on legitimate users, we simulate on a hundred thousand sample of legitimate users and build up this figure. The false reject rate curve means the probability of legitimate users whose falsely rejected in our system. We can say the curve keeps low within 1,000 touches, which equals to 16 minutes of the usage. The false reject rate curve increases slowly due to the gigakimate users whose force is rejected by the system will be accumulated during usage. But for 2.64 hours of long-time usage, the false reject rate curve is also kept below 0.9%. So, even gigakimate users like need to use smartphones for 2 hours every time. It will be hardly influenced by touch sense. Due to the hardware limitation, in the current work, we only use a single sensor to authenticate users by single finger touching. In future, we want to authenticate users by sensor array. The sensor array means the deploy of sensitive sensing points on the screen with a high resolution sensor. To cover a 6 inch screen, we only need to deploy 12 sensing points. By this, we can enable in authentication for multi finger touch and further improves accuracy. TouchSense sketches the authentication results of each finger touching and build up the user legitimate model to comprehensively evaluate the user's legitimacy, which also improves the accuracy. In future, we will use sensor array to authenticate users, which can further improve the accuracy and may open up new application directions. TouchSense make up the flow of existing user authentication schemes, which can continuously work during using without user assistance. To find the best results of TouchSense, we did mass experimentation on the performance of TouchSense and found the optimal configuration which can quickly distinguish attackers and hardly influence the normal use of legitimate users. With the merits of high security, user transparency, low power consumption, and continuous security, we foresee that TouchSense can be widely deployed on smartphones in the future. Thanks for listening.
Hello, everyone. I'm gonna present our research on the behalf of our team. Our research is about low carbon emission driven traffic speed optimization for Internet of Vehicles. First, let me introduce the contents of our research. It is gonna include introduction, interaction between vehicles and the traffic signals within IOV, simulation framework of the track flow, carbon dioxide emissions. Then is, we're going to talk about the impact of speed on vehicles, carbon dioxide emission. <clears throat> then we have the recommended speed calculation scheme and the simulation and the result. Finally, we're going to give you the conclusions of our research. Begin. First is the introduction. Climate change and global warming has become a worldwide challenge to the transportation system. It is one of the causes that are largely responsible for the depletion of fossil fuels, the environmental contamination, and the climate warming in recent decades. We'll say new technologies for speed optimization control and the traffic management are critical to lower transport emissions. So, Internet of Vehicles based low carbon transportation management system is a crucial path to lower carbon dioxide emissions. <clears throat> As you say, IOV technologies can be applied to driving speed optimization, enhance energy efficiency, and reduce carbon dioxide emissions. We propose a IOV-based carbon dioxide emission-driven traffic speed optimization scheme to avoid like sudden acceleration, deceleration, idling, and other driving behaviors so as to improve the traffic efficiency at signalized intersection and the energy saving and emission reduction effect of vehicles. Next, we're going to talk about the interaction between vehicles and the traffic signals within IOV. It is predicted that more than 24 billion things are expected to be interconnected by <clears throat> 2020, with the vehicles occupying an important place. IOV is consist of integrated users, vehicles, things, environment, and networks. It is a dynamic mobile communication system characterized by the collection, sharing, handling, calculating, and secure delivery of data. This paper presumes that all the signal controllers are guilt with a roadside unit ICU. Each vehicle is provided with an onboard unit OBU. OBU and ICU are capable of mutual communication. Each ICU can communicate with the vehicle if within the coverage of IOV communication. As shown in the figure 1, we can see that in the ICU at an intersection, while sending packets, periodically corresponds with the vehicles in all directions. Once <clears throat> the vehicle enters this range, it receives information from the intersection ICU broadcast, and it sends its position, speed, direction information to the ICU via a packet. After receiving the packet, the ICU sends the data to the traffic control center via the physical device. After receiving related information, the OBU will analyze and provide a recommended driving speed. This speed helps the driver to reach the destination with higher driving efficiency, thus enhancing the traffic efficiency. So this is the IOV architecture is used for sharing road traffic flow data with adjacent, adjacent intersection and for the whole city traffic management as well. Next, we're going to see the simulation framework of traffic flow carbon dioxide emission. This is a simulation framework <clears throat> based on which we're going to start or carry out our simulation. And we have this framework as a picture. And our paper introduces a carbon dioxide 
emission estimation model to illustrate the relationship between carbon dioxide emission and the vehicle motion status. The, it is illustrated as the equation below. In those two equations, E signifies the carbon dioxide efficient emission, T and D indicate the travel distance and the travel time respectively, T and D. And K describe the coefficient, A and VK are the accelerated speed, value and the velocity in time K, respectively. <clears throat> In a world when the travel distance is constant, vehicle carbon dioxide emissions are largely rest on the driving time and the accelerated speed value. What comes next is the impact of speed on vehicle with carbon dioxide emission. Carbon dioxide emission of vehicle is usually related to average speed. Researchers, researchers often use average speed as a measure of traffic performance. When the vehicle stops, the engine turns, emission can increase indefinitely. When vehicles tra travel at higher speed, the engine loads are higher, which requires more fuel consumption and lead to higher carbon dioxide emissions. <clears throat> a driving process can be divided into Two parts, two parts, an idling and the driving, which include accelerating, cruising, and deceleration. Engine consumes more energy and release more carbon dioxide <clears throat> at idle than when the vehicle is in motion. Moreover, reducing waiting time and driving at a constant velocity will result in lower carbon dioxide emissions. And studies have shown that the vehicles have higher emission when accelerating and decelerating than when idling. Moreover, the most common causes of the engine idling is stop and go because vehicles slow down, stop, and then speed up. For a short time. During that time, the vehicle releases more carbon dioxide. So, after we have made clear of the impact of speed on vehicles' carbon dioxide emission, we can finally come to the recommended speed calculation scheme. In the scheme, we have many have three parts: the road condition detection, information exchange, and the recommended speed calculation. For the road condition detection, we say road conditions include current vehicle velocity, vehicle spacing, and vehicle distance to destination. Traffic signal information should also be included when vehicles arrive at intersection. Information exchange for the information exchange, this information exchange process is shown as um, follows first. When the vehicle arrives at intersection, the onboard unit and the onboard unit <coughs> of the vehicle will send the status information of the vehicle to the traffic signal. Then the traffic signal receives the information from the vehicle and sends the status of the signal back to the vehicle. Then for the recommended speed calculation, the more times the car stops, the more carbon dioxide is released through the journey. In this regard, consider giving drivers the recommended speed and speeding through intersection with a reasonable range to avoid unnecessary stops. The distance between the uh, vehicle and the traffic light can be easily obtained through the GPS device. The vehicle is able to compute a recommended velocity after receiving the following messages to avoid vehicle waiting at the intersection. If the vehicles cannot can cross the intersection with current velocity, then we're going to reduce the number of vehicle stops. So <clears throat> that's clear of some conditions. Um, for the current traffic light status, we have green, yellow, and red. Then current traffic light status remaining time, we have LG, LR, and Y. And then this is the current traffic light cycle, CL, the duration of the three stages. 
um, among which Cl equals Tg plus Ty and Tr. And the P, for the P, they represent the vehicle space in which one is the relatively large and one is the relatively small. This one, they represent the time it takes the vehicle to pass through the intersection at the current speed, and D means distance. This one, the next one, is refers to the time taken for the vehicle to pass through the intersection at the maximum speed and also the distance is <clears throat> reflected by D. Last, if the space between the two cars at this time is relatively small, so the vehicle speed is not greater than the front of the vehicle speed, the calculation is as this one, as this one. <clears throat> Scenario is the current traffic signal is red. It's red. For the first one, it means that after the red light turns to green, the vehicle can reach the intersection at the current speed and keep a certain distance between the front and the rear vehicle. Then the recommended speed is set to the current speed, which is calculated as this one. Then it means that the during the remaining red light time plus green time, the vehicles cannot reach the intersection at the current speed, but can reach the intersection at the maximum speed. So um, the two vehicles, so in this case, it's necessary to accelerate it to the maximum speed. So we say SR equals S max. The third one, it means that the vehicle still cannot reach the intersection with the maximum speed before the traffic light changes from green to yellow. The vehicle needs to wait for at least one traffic signal cycle and keep a certain distance between the front and the rear vehicles. In this case, the car must slow down, must slow down. So it's our calculation is as follows as this one. Well, the NR represents the number of cycles in which vehicles need to wait for traffic signals during the red light period. Last, if the space between um, <clears throat> the two cars at this time is relatively small, so the vehicle speed is not greater than the front of the vehicle speed. The calculation is as this one. The last scenario. The current traffic lights are yellow. Compared to the case of red light, the vehicle needs one or more yellow light time. The calculation of the recommended speed is similar to that of the current red light scheme. The calculation formula are shown as below because it's similar to the red light, so I'm not going to elaborate on this one. The sixth part is the simulation and the results. And we have three figures which demonstrate some results of our simulation. In figure four and five, this shows that compared with no recommended speed vehicles with recommended speed can drive across the intersection with shorter waiting time and less stops. Moreover, vehicles with the recommended speed will have less waiting time than vehicles with small traffic flow at the same time. Therefore, the driving efficiency can be greatly improved by the recommended speed. The SR is calculated to achieve the maximum possible speed through the intersection without stopping and the figure 6 shows 
the amount of carbon dioxide released by vehicles with no recommended speed higher than those with the recommended speed do, with increase of the flow of traffic, the amount of carbon dioxide release growth of the vehicle with the recommended speed is not big. The amount of carbon dioxide released growth of the vehicles with no recommended speed in case of the light traffic flow is also not big. However. <clears throat> As can be seen from the above figures, with the increase of traffic flow compared with the speed without、uh, recommended speed without recommendation, the average waiting time of vehicles passing the intersection will be shorter. So the total driving time will be reduced, and the uninterrupted pass rate will be higher. At the same time, vehicle energy efficiency will be enhanced, which will cut down carbon dioxide emissions. Finally, we comes to the conclusions. We have some conclusions of our research. We know <clears throat> there are a large number of signal exception in urban roads due to the periodic interference of their. Control signals, vehicle velocity fluctuation will occur, leading to the leading to the increase of vehicles' traffic and, and energy efficiency and the pollution、um, pollutant discharge when driving across the intersection. Under our recommended scheme, the drivers would be noticed to drive with the optimized speed. The vehicles use the information gathered to calculate. A、uh, recommended speed that maximizes the vehicle's ability to drive through the intersection in a smooth, low carbon, and environmentally friendly manner. The benefits observed have shown the low carbon potential of a IOV-based intelligent traffic signal management system, and because all their benefits, we should use the political. Um, well, and commitment is of critical importance for the development of low carbon traffic system and for the IOV technology development. We should take best use of all the sources we can get, and、uh, emphasize the concerted effort so as to realize a desired result, such as the、um, carbon di dioxide reduction and energy efficiency production、uh, improvement. That's all. Thank you for your listening.
Hello everyone. I'm from Tianjin University of Technology, and I'm honored to participate in this conference. The topic of my paper is Android malware detection using ensemble learning on sensitive APIs. My speech mainly consists of five parts: abstract, brief in introduction, the research mentality and the process, solutions and summary, and conclusion. First is the abstract. In this paper, we propose a static Android malicious detection scheme based on sensitive API calls. We extracted all APIs called in the experimental samples through decompilation, and then calculated and ranked the threats related to these APIs. According to the mutual information model, selected the top twenty sensitive API calls and generated a twenty-dimensional feature vector for each application. In the classification process, an integrated learning model based on DT classifier. KNN classifier and SVM classifier is used to effectively detect unknown APK samples. We collected 516 benign applications and 528 malicious applications. Through a large number of experiments, the results show that the accuracy of our scheme can be up to 94 percent, and the precision is up to 95 percent. The second part is the introduction. The specific experimental content of this paper is as follows: In order to reduce the amount of redundant API information during Android malware detection and improve malware detection efficiency, we use sensitive API calls as detection features. Through experiments, in order to obtain a more complete and effective set of sensitive API calls as feature vectors, it is proposed to use the mutual information model to rank the correlation between API calls and applications. At the same time, we tested the detection. Performance of different combinations of various classification algorithms. Finally, a fast and accurate detection method based on integrated learning algorithm is proposed, in which DT classifier, KNN classifier, and SVM classifier are selected. At basic classifiers, experiments show that our method can reduce the complexity of Android malware detection, and to a certain extent, improve the detection accuracy and reduce the false alarm rate.、And、the third part is the research mentality and. The Process. We found that the frequency of calling certain APIs is quite different between malicious applications and normal applications through experiments. Therefore, 
these sensitive APIs can be used as one of the basis for identifying the maliciousness of our application. The paper used an effective sorting method, mutual information, to measure the correlation between Android applications and specific API calls. And based on the calculated correlation, a set of sensitive APIs is generated. In this reason, in this paper, the reason why we chose the top 20 APIs for sensitivity calculation as the reference standard for selected feature APIs is because if the number of selected APIs is too small, it cannot be accurately de detected and distinguished malicious applications and benign applications. If too many APIs are selected, it will cause redundancy of data value, reduce the efficiency of detection, and increase the time complexity of detection. Based on the 20 dimensional sensitive API in the feature library, extracted the API from the APK file and generate a set of 20 dimensional feature vectors according to the above data format. And then input the 20 dimensional feature vectors into KNN DT and SVM consists of these three base classifiers. The result DT, result KNN, and result SVM will be placed at 1 if the detected application is a benign application. Otherwise, it will be placed at 0 if the detected application is a malicious application. For the detection of an unknown application, the threshold of the detection model is set to 0 0.5. Because of the probability of an unknown application being classified as a malicious application is the same as that of a deny benign application. If the final result is greater than 0 0.5, the application will be judged to a benign application. If the final result is smaller than 0 0.5, the application will be judged to a malicious application. If the result is equal to 0 0.5, then further manual recognition is required. However, the experimental results show that the probability or this situation is low, about 2% to 4%. The value of the final result can be the probability that the application is classified as a benign application. The fourth part is solution and uh, summary. As shown in the picture, the effect on the detection model has been improved significantly in terms of precision. True positive rate 
and accuracy when the set of sensitive API calls is adopted. Among them, accuracy can reach 94%, while the precision can be reached 95%. In addition, our method proposed in this paper can achieve true positive rate of 89%. In the case of false positive rate, the model with the set of sensitive API calls is not very different from the model without it. Both of them are slightly higher in the false positive rate. This is an issue that needs to be further addressed. It also will be the focus of our future research and the direction of improvement. In all, our method of malicious application detection based on the set of sensitive API calls has a better detection result. We, we conduct five comparative experiments and calculated their mean. In each experiment, we verify the accuracy and the false positive rate of different classifier respectively. The first set of experiment only carries out the detection of the KNN classifier. In the second set of experiment, the DT classifier is used for detection. In the third set of experiment, our method is used for detecting. It is known from the experiment's results that the method presented in this paper has a good effect on accuracy and reduce the false positive rate to a certain extent simultaneously. Of course, we choose five sets of different classification algorithms with higher accuracy to analyze our experimental results. It can be seen that the whole system achieves the best performance in these five algorithms when adopting the ensemble learning model of DT and KN and SVM algorithm after by combining the results of the TPR and PRE. At the same time, we also conducted corresponding experiments on the different ways occupied by the KN classifier, DT classifier and SVM classifier in the integrated learning module. And give the classification results of the DT, KN, and SVM classifiers, respectively. Different weights and the final test result is calculated according to the linear weighted sum. It can be seen from the calculation that there are 36 different weight distribution combinations in total. In this study, we conducted corresponding experiments on each combination of weights. We selected nine re representative weight combinations for drawing. It can be seen that the detection result of the whole system is the most optional when the weight of the DT classifier is 0 0.2 and the width of KNA is 0 0.3 and the width of SVM calisphere is 0 0.5. Finally, the paper proposed an Android malicious application detection model based on integrated learning. 
by extracting API functions called by Android applications and combining mutual information modules. Machine learning algorithms are used to generate a set of sensitive APIs. Then selected the first 20 sensitive API functions as the feature library to generate 20 dimensional feature vectors. The integrated learning model based on KNN classifier, DT classifier, and SVM classifier is used to effectively detect and new under applications. Experimental results show that this method has achieved good results in precision, DPR, and accuracy. However, the method proposed in this paper still has a slightly higher false alarm rate. In future research, we will conduct more experimental research to reduce the false alarm rate while ensuring the accuracy of detection, so as to improve the detection capability of unknown Android applications. Thank you.
Thank you.
Welcome to the keynote talk on Edge Intelligence, the Convergence of Humans, IoT, and AI. In this talk, I'm going to discuss the recent developments of IoT, Edge, Fog, and Cloud Computing and how that actually relates to artificial intelligence. Um, some of the issues are uh, pretty recent and discuss research challenges uh, lying ahead of us. So when we look into the current developments of systems development, we realize that actually in the, compared to the past, we are facing a new situation. And the new situation is as such that in the past we had uh, people interacting with systems only. They were not part of the systems themselves typically. And the other novelty is that the Internet of Things has arrived. Um, so the question is, how do we actually integrate the systems into the design, into the modeling, into the monitoring and its relationship to the other components? And finally, the third aspect of the evolution of current information systems is that software services are also part of this. In the past, we were only focusing on software services predominantly. People were outside the system simply interacting with the system. So the question now becomes, how do we actually design systems, monitor systems, build systems, test systems, which are composed out of the three components of people, software services, and things. And there are a couple of examples uh, of such systems, which I call elastic systems. So we have representations of those in smart homes, in uh, health network systems, in governmental administrative systems, uh, in transportation uh, systems and transportation networks, as many of you work in this space. Energy networks is another example. All of these systems have as an example that they are actually built with these three building blocks. And the question remains, how do we actually create these systems? Now, when we look at these types of systems, we realize that these three components, these three entities are intimately connected with each other. So everything is connected with each other. And this represents a fundamental challenge that, that actually lies in front of us. When we look into uh, or we look at a system such as this, we can make a comparison to ecosystems in nature, for example. In nature, what we see here is a system which is composed, like is depicted in this figure here, the, mm, composed of uh, uh, the sun, the birds, the rocks, the water, the fish, the plants, everything uh, as in, in depicted in this marine ecosystem example. And what we can see here is that we are seeing a complex system which is uh, intrinsically uh, connected. It is a complex network. It has network dependencies and as such it also has adaptive behavior. And I think this is pretty similar to the type of system that we have to build in the future. A ecosystem like this one depicted here has a number of very interesting feature we should study in engineering. One is that it is resilient and robust in a sense that it has these mechanisms built in. Um, so it achieves stability even in the presence of disruption. That disruption is somehow uh, key to ecosystems. They are resilient in a sense that they are adapting to the situation and this adaptation is not really visible with within when we just look at the building blocks. So these yellow arrows that you see here on uh, between the entities in this marine ecosystem, they have actually built in some resilient mechanism. And I will discuss that what I believe uh, could be helpful for systems design that mimics this behavior. The second aspect is that what we see in ecosystems is that we, we have measures of health. So in other words, we can say something about how healthy is that system? Uh, how healthy uh, is it regarding key indicators of the system itself? Um, the third aspect is that it has built-in coherence. This means that the system itself is uh, having, so to say, a purpose. It has a focus uh, and by that it actually helps to, to not uh, decompose in itself, which is the fourth uh, attribute, which is that ecosystems typically have some properties of being entropy resistant. Entropy being a measure which we know um, 
from other sciences is that uh, it's a measure of disorder. So uh, also in information systems, we know that systems which are not maintained, they tend to disorder, they have a high entropy. And this is also very true for systems, ecosystems in our world nowadays, where we have people, software systems, and things being meshed together. So what we can say essentially is that these ecosystems that we are seeing, um, they can be kind of, uh, we can also map what we see in nature and map that to the uh, IT uh, world, if you like. So instead of the players in the, in, in the natural world with the sun, the gravitational pull, the fishes, the rocks, the plants, etc., we have all kinds of different entities, as, we, as I was arguing before. We have all these different uh, infrastructures in the IT world, such as uh, storage, computational power, networks, different IoT devices, sensors, what have you, cloud computers, etc. All of these are actually building blocks of our ecosystems that we have to build. And one of the fundamental challenges that is lying in front of us is that we have to learn better and to uh, become much better at how do we actually design such systems that have all these different entities being put together. So simply creating systems from a fragmented worldview is not sufficient anymore. This fragmentation has led to a number of massive problems and if we don't stop following this fragmentation, it will become... One example I would like to bring here uh, is the smart city itself. If you look at a smart city, what we can say is that in a smart city we have things in the sense of the Internet of Things, right? So we have all types of sensors, fire sensors, air sensors, traffic density sensors, video surveillance of all sorts, humidity sensors, sensors for trash, sensors for parking spaces, for containers, uh, smart meters, etc. So this is pretty common and we are getting more and more used to these types of uh, sensors and Internet of Things. The second aspect that, that we are having experience is we have, of course, software services out there. We have systems that uh, measuring uh, traffic control, detecting the people, detecting uh, uh, facility management aspects, providing services for water management, um, uh, garbage collection, automated parking, etc. Those software services are actually building on top of the data that they get from different types of sensors. So these software services have been the primary concern of the computer science community, of course, because we are building uh, software systems. Now those things increasingly are being becoming, a, so to say, a first-class citizen in the types of systems that we have to create. The third aspect are people, right? So we are, as people, also participants in this smart city. Um, we are uh, running around, we provide uh, information uh, where we go, which uh, spaces we go to, which places we go to, how long we spend our time there, etc. And finally, when we also have a look at the data aspects, we realize that this data is actually creating a, a, a lot of rich richness in, in the sense because everything is then becoming provided together. The, things, the software services, the people, and all of the data that is connecting all of those aspects together. So what we have learned in the last decade or so is that we should provide everything as a service. So in other words, all of these different building blocks in such an ecosystem are provided as a service in order to be able to compose these different building blocks together. I think this is one of the main lessons in the last decade from service-oriented architectures that we are able to actually compose systems. And this composition of systems in the past has been focused on software and now we are increasingly uh, moving towards uh, this composition with services not only from traditional software components but now also with hardware components and increasingly uh, with things as well. And now this is a very interesting aspect which I'm going to discuss uh, in, in, in the future here. So when we look into the types of systems that we currently have that we can utilize, 
we can see that there are different perspectives. If you look at the spectrum of te technologies provided today, we have the IoT, we have the Edge, we have the Cloud, we have the Internet, we have the Fox. So how are they related with each other? So one way to look at it is, is, is a cloud-centric perspective. So the cloud-centric perspective basically says that the cloud is the center of the universe. Everything is connected to the cloud. So in other words, even the internet is not the center of the universe. It is just all leading to the cloud. All the data is uh, stored on the cloud. All the intelligence is uh, on the cloud. Uh, the things are actually outside, still connected to the cloud. Without the cloud computing infrastructure, there is no decision making, there is no intelligence. So that would be equal to, if I use another analogy, if we use uh, the human brain as a representative uh, of the intelligence and we say all the decisions are being made by the brain only. There is no autonomic nervous system. All the decision making, like taking every breath every, every couple of seconds, is basically delegated to the brain, which is not the case. So we do have different layers here in place. Uh, for example, the autonomic nervous system, which basically thinks, uh, delegates certain aspects to lower um, abstractions, if you wish. So um, in the IoT world, this basically represents pretty much the situation that we currently have. This means that all of the information is streamed from IoT sensors to the cloud. All the learning is happening on the cloud. The decisions are made on the cloud and is then pushed back to the actuator level on the lower uh, levels of abstraction of, of the network, if you like. So this is the cloud-centric perspective. Of course, this has been the predominant uh, way that we are designing systems nowadays. There is another alternative view of this, which is the what I call here the internet-centric perspective, which basically says the internet itself is uh, the internet as it is. And all of these different aspects like the cloud, the IoT, the edge are all lay, lay, layers around this uh, internet. So this has a number of, uh, a, a lot of impacts actually on the design decisions that we make. One is that the cloud-centric perspective, as I was saying, has this assumption that there is a central intelligence and all data has to be uh, sent to the cloud. Of course, this has tremendous impact on the network itself and um, also a lot of implications on what it actually means for the system's design regarding networking, storage, computational power, scaling, and etc. Um, the internet-centric perspective has a different set of assumptions. It actually also assumes that there is some level of autonomy at the edge of the network. So in other words, when you look at where the data is actually coming from, that part is closer to the edges of the network, right? So you have IoT sensors, those IoT sensors actually create data. That data then is uh, computed, stored, learned, what have you, and then maybe um, sent somewhere else for further processing, but not necessarily. So there is some level of autonomy towards the edges of the network. And this is, of course, the uh, paradigm that we are uh, moving towards. So in other words, what we can say is that we can see pretty much every 10 years the pendulum between centralization and decentralization going back and forth. In the last 10 years, we pretty much had a centralization uh, uh, pull towards cloud computing. Um, and now what we are observing is that there is a lot of uh, push again to the decentralized aspects, to the distribution aspects, which means that aspects like uh, edge computing um, become more prominent now because now the question becomes, is it possible to actually do processing also towards the edges of the network? Um, why is that important? We are witnessing a number of uh, examples uh, in different domains and I have depicted a couple of those domains here in this example slide on, on analytics where we can actually think about different scenarios. 
so one scenario could be that I would like to ask questions such as, what actually is the energy consumption of the building I'm currently in? Or what is the energy consumption of all the buildings in this street? What is the energy consumption uh, of all the buildings of uh, this certain region where I'm actually situated in? Um, or I could ask another question. I could say basically going across different domains, I could ask questions regarding social well-being, um, such as what is the, the wellness situation in a certain region of town, in a certain street, in a certain set of buildings? Or governments could ask uh, questions such as what is the uh, situation regarding waste management re in a certain region, in a certain street, in a certain uh, number of streets, etc. So these types of questions illustrate that the traditional way that we have uh, been building vertical systems with uh, very you know, closed types of questions that we can ask then is actually coming to an end. And we have to design systems in a different way namely in a way where everything is provided as a service and we can also ask questions in a different way where we can have different ways to look into the data, put these aspects together and make sense out of them. Now, this brings us to the current situation and the current situation is that we have a whole continuum of mm, paradigms de facto ready to, to serve us. This is what I call here in this slide the IoT edge fog cloud continuum. On a, from a high level perspective, what we can say is that we have different levels of, uh, in this architecture. So what we can see is that we have uh, the low, on the lowest layer, we have uh, a, a number of IoT devices under quotes. These IoT devices can be many different things, right? They can be a car, or in one part of a car, but they can also be like a mobile device or a camera for video surveillance, etc. Uh, on the next levels, we have actually uh, a number of edge devices, so-called edge devices or previously called gateways, which accumulate data from a number of such IoT sensors. These IoT sensors basically do not have the capacity to transfer all of their data directly to the cloud. So what they do is a number of these IoT devices uh, bun are bundled and their data is being processed, stored, whatever, on different edge devices. On the next layer, uh, these edge devices uh, could be uh, uh, synchronized, put together, if you like, under the umbrella of so-called fog computing. In fog computing, basically, you could say that different uh, providers, such as telco operators, could accumulate a number of this data from different edge providers and operate and uh, compute and store, etc., uh, on those base stations in the fog uh, and do some processing and make some decisions, etc. And those fog uh, base stations could then also transfer data or not making that decision to uh, the cloud. Whereas the cloud itself could also be a private cloud, a public cloud or a hybrid cloud. So there are different ways how we could see that. So what we can observe is that de facto there is a whole set of uh, a compute continuum. It is not only uh, the cloud or the fog, etc. They all actually have to play together in order to make a useful uh, use of all of these uh, services. Now, what we can see is that all of these different um, uh, layers of abstraction which are currently uh, available are actually provided also by different entities. So what we can observe now is that we have the IT companies, predominantly the big five IT companies, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, etc., providing a lot of cloud infrastructure. On the other hand, there are a number of telcos, telco operators uh, uh, moving um, very prominently, like Huawei or others, into pushing their offerings into becoming fog or edge providers, right? 
Now, this is a very interesting uh, aspect because um, uh, these edge providers can be these manufacturers uh, of this networking or the telcos itself themselves. And they can then provide a number of uh, infrastructure components which also are useful for corporations or for individuals to store uh, their software on. And the question is then, how do we actually as engineers create that software which is then transcending the individual organizational boundaries and going to be deployed, managed, monitored, etc., on all of these different parts of the infrastructure. So we have a, a very large uh, complex infrastructure composing, uh, composed, being composed of IoT sensors, edge gateways, fog base stations, cloud computing uh, data centers, and application providers have a hybrid scenario where they have to create these mechanisms to decide where their application components can be actually deployed. Are they deployed on edge devices? Are they deployed on fog devices, base stations, or on the cloud? Who is responsible? So the most likely scenario de facto is that this is a hybrid scenario for many uh, entities. And the question then is, what are the mechanisms that we are actually creating, managing, and governing this diverse infrastructure? Now, if you look at it uh, from a uh, higher level perspective, you can see that the question then becomes, how can I shift, move, basically, data, software, decision-making, models, learning, horizontally uh, or vertically along these uh, lines of what we were just discussing. This is one of the fundamental high-level questions which are uh, very is very difficult to answer de facto because it depends on so many different aspects. And we're going to discuss this in the next couple of, uh, of slides. This computing continuum is ranging a huge uh, set of infrastructure components from data centers uh, on servers to mini computers to clusters of smaller boxes to micro clouds as is depicted on, on, on this uh, slide that you see here. And there are many different uh, research questions that one can ask, namely, how is it possible that we design systems, software in particular, that is able to move between these different uh, computing continuum devices? Because in reality, we don't want to create software which is only running on one particular set of hardware. We would like to have that software being able to run on micro clouds as depicted on the right hand side here with Raspberry Pis or what have you, but also able to move to, to cloud infrastructures and data centers. And this is one of the fundamental challenges what we have. So this means that we have to ask ourselves the question, how can we move towards what I call here edge intelligence? How is it possible that we create a computational fabric which allows us to use all of these dispersed resources and allow for training, monitoring and serving of these models? And what is in particular very difficult is because we have a heterogeneous applications and models and they require different parts of the infrastructure and because of the scale of the infrastructure, they also require different mechanisms. And finally, all of this AI infrastructure uh, for edge intelligence also needs to be automated at some point, right? So this automation is a beast in itself, if you like. So what is necessary for such an, a fabric of edge intelligence? In particular, I would like to talk about three uh, aspects. The first one is sensing or sense of data as a service. So basically, we have a large number of dynamic and mobile pops up uh, publishers and subscribers of sense of data and quality of service requirements in this edge intelligence scenarios. And so far, what we have typically in industry is a centralized messaging services such as Amazon Web Service IoT or Microsoft Azure IoT Hub. But we have to move away from the centralized approach to a highly decentralized approach for sensing. This is number one. 
The second aspect is that we increasingly have edge computing devices and networks with modular AI capabilities. This means that we have a lot of AI accelerators for these edge devices. A number of examples like Google Edge TPU, uh, Microsoft uh, Brainwave. We have uh, examples from Intel, Baidu or Huawei. The third aspect is that all of this is all nice, but of course the power lies in the coordination of it all. And this means that we have to have intelligent orchestration mechanisms for the decentralized and distributed infrastructure. Now, these different edge AI accelerators I was talking about here, you can see some depiction of how it actually looks like. So increasingly these AI capabilities uh, these uh, neural components, etc., are being put on hardware and being provided to the different building blocks of the typical hardware devices that we actually use in our compute infrastructure every day. We are also experimenting a lot with these types of uh, systems, creating our own edge intelligence, intelligence fabric, where we actually put uh, this AI acceleration uh, on top of Raspberry Pis, for example, where we have intelligent decision making on where which uh, raspberries to uh, uh, switch on and switch off depending on the energy consumption or different uh, optimization criteria and then uh, provide a learning mechanism uh, in, in this example depicted in this picture and you can see a number of uh, examples provided here in the slide where we actually do research uh, based on this so this is pretty much uh, early, early research in this space where we look into, into these aspects. Now, when we look into the question of, we have now all of these infrastructure components uh, of this uh, ecosystem that we were talking about initially. And now, if you remember the slide I was showing about natural ecosystems, the different building blocks had uh, these yellow arrows, right? And these yellow arrows, were essentially one of the fundamental building blocks, as I believe, uh, for these types of systems. Uh, why? Because they enable resilience. And one of the fundamental mechanisms to enable resilience is to allow for elasticity. Now, elasticity is a property that we know from physics, from material science, which says something about the property of the material. If you put stress on it, it will deform. If you take away the stress, it will go back to its initial state. This is what uh, elasticity is. And the question now is, is it possible to actually create, to replicate that, um, uh, that mechanism that we know from material science, from nature, also into the world of computer science. Is it possible to create systems that are not only able to scale, but also able to have elasticity uh, properties? What do I mean? When you look at scalability, we build systems typically with the worst case in mind. The worst case means that we create the system having the worst case assumption about the number of people accessing the system, the worst case uh, assumption about how many, uh, how many database queries, what is the network load, what is the load on the system properties, the software, etc., etc. However, most of the time it is not the worst case that is actually happening in reality. Uh, so ideally what we would like to have is a property of elasticity, right? So in a sense, mimicking also our own human body. So when there is a lot of stress, we are able to leave the comfort zone, so to speak, provide a higher heart rate, etc. But if we, if we relax, we go back to the norm. Um, so similarly, what we would like to have is a, a system which is able to add and remove resources. So this is typically what is understood with uh, under elasticity. This is one aspect which is important and good. That resource elasticity means not only hardware resources or software resources, but in fact could also mean additional people resources. Uh, but I don't have time in this talk to go deeper into this. But resource elasticity is one aspect. The other aspect are two other components. One is quality elasticity, meaning that I would have consider 
to consider all non-functional parameters as well. So for example, I'm concerned in uh, the aspect of quality of the data input and quality of the data output as well. And the third aspect would be cost elasticity. So in other words, what I am interested in or what we as designers of such systems are typically interested in is not only how many resources do I want to add and remove for a particular uh, time in space, but what I would like to do is I would like to create a system which is able to add resources, remove resources in order to provide necessary quality of the data, quality of the service input and output, also considering the cost. And this is what we mean with uh, elastic computing. So this means that every system essentially that we are designing from now on has to create and operate inside this trade-off model in this three-dimensional space. So we basically say, okay, I'm gonna use this amount or this type of resource provided that I get this quality of the data, for example, a data resolution, but only if the cost is not higher than X. If you cannot provide that sweet spot in this three-dimensional space, I'm not interested at all, or I have a different type of uh, thing that I would like to uh, get from the infrastructure. So this is now interesting because we are able to formulate these different elasticity requirements from a system that we would like to have in this uh, computing continuum. However, there is not such a system in place where I can define this elasticity policies really. So we have created one basically represented in this slide uh, in one of the EU projects that we had a couple of years ago where we are able to define with a language that we have created called Sybil what are the actual constraints that we would like to define and what are the strategies that we need to follow and then this intelligence is then built into in this case, the cloud infrastructure um, that allows us to move and shift different deployments deployed on different virtual machines in order to satisfy the constraints that we have defined. But as you can see here, those constraint satisfactions are done or formulated on a higher level of abstraction, right? Um, so, for example, I would like to have uh, maximum data freshness, but only if the I.O. cost is smaller uh, than three euro, as, as depicted in this example. And if it's not the case, I will try to resolve that by shifting uh, things around. And if it's possible, uh, the service is provided. If it's not possible to provide that elasticity requirement, then it is not provided. So this is a very fundamental new way to approach the design of such systems. So in a sense, what we would achieve with this is that we can look at the timeline of any application uh, along the time axis. And what we see is that we define the elasticity space and the elasticity space basically says something about is my application within these boundaries that I have defined as constraints depicted with these orange lines at the bottom and at the top. And the elasticity pathway basically says something about the characterization of the elasticity behavior for a particular view. So for example, I could say then, okay, how does my cost actually evolves over time? And I can look at the pathway and can say, okay, my, my costs uh, evolve over time along this uh, pathway. And then I can make decisions if the dimensioning of my systems is a, a good thing or not. Now, this is one of the important uh, aspects, I think, the elasticity aspect. Now let's shift gears and look into the uh, uh, learning aspect. As we have discussed in the IoT world, edge, fog, and cloud world, we have a fundamental uh, issue. All of this data that is coming in uh, from, from remote uh, devices uh, has a particular purpose, right? So we have to train on that data, either, either directly or uh, using those remote devices, actually without revealing the data themselves. So the question is typically, where does the model aggregation, uh, where does the, the global model actually, where is it being created? Can it be created somewhere along this con continuum or everything has to be created on the cloud? 
and then made uh, available to other sites. And this is one of the fundamental questions. And this, if you look into more detail, brings a lot of different issues. So there are a, a lot of different applications which require a solution to this aspect of uh, this intelligence spread across this co computing continuum. Um, for mobile devices, for example, uh, face detection, voice recognition, training on data for, from smartphones, cameras, microphones, but we don't want to uh, reveal our own identity. So is it possible to learn uh, on, on individual devices and make use of that learning without revealing who I am? That's for personal devices. For organizations, the question is, is it possible to, to learn here? Uh, for example, in hospitals, but not to expose the data of the individual patients. Um, for higher level of abstractions, so uh, for environmental transportation, smart homes, etc. So sensors in smart homes is a similar example. So can I provide some learnings to other levels of abstraction without, you know, making my identity known to others? Um, so this is one of the fundamental aspects that we are facing now. So this basically leads to a number of research challenges that we have to face. So uh, basically what, what I call here device recruitment strategies. So which subsets of devices uh, are assisting in these learning tasks? Processing, storage, battery, etc. is related to this. Uh, questions regarding volatility. The devices, they can disappear, appear at any point in time. This brings with it a number of challenges. The timing aspect, so asynchrony. asynchrony. Uh, so the algorithms, they face challenges when end devices do not submit their data in a timely manner. Um, Non-independent and identically distributed data. So what do we do when the data is inaccurate, when uh, personalization is lost? heterogeneity in the volume of training data per device uh, might lead actually to biased model. So this bias in the model, because we have different volume or different uh, uh, detail of the data, is a very fundamental problem too. So we are giving prejudice then to one particular uh, data source when we have more data than the other. So this is a, a problem in, in the model creation. Preventing privacy leaks. So some private information may be inferred even if the devices do not transmit uh, the actual data. So there are a lot of publications and research discussing exactly this. Um, incentives to misbehave, basically. So why waste battery when I can let the others do all the work, right? So this is also one of the research challenges. So based on this, we have created a research roadmap, which I would like to present to you, which is uh, published in the paper called Edge Intelligence, the confluence of edge computing and uh, artificial intelligence, which is forthcoming in the IEEE IoT journal. But you can see a preprint now on my homepage, but also on the IEEE IoT journal page, which basically discusses what are the research challenges in this uh, aspect. And we look at it from the perspective from the user first with the quality of experience as we call it here. And what is the quality of experience that the user uh, designer actually wants from such a system in, in, with the edge intelligence? So there are five different distinct aspects. The first one is performance, right? So I would like to have the ratio uh, of computation offloading. I have to have a, a, a distinct decision how do I want to make this offloading to these different areas of my compute continuum? The second aspect relates, for example, to cost. So how much does the computation cost? How much does the communication cost? Uh, how much is the energy consumption cost? The third is regarding privacy and security. So aspects like federated learning. So can I aggregate local machine models from distributed edge devices? Efficiency, uh, I would like to have excellent performance with a low overhead, so model compression, conditional computation becomes key here, and reliability. So can I uh, have a model upload and download in wireless network, even if it is congested, right? So based on these 
uh, different high-level quality of experience questions, I can then make the distinction between AI for the edge or AI on the edge. This is now a very fundamental distinction which I would like to discuss here. So if we look at AI for the edge, we have a number of uh, research questions which relate the bottom-up strategy in a, in a sense. So we look at topologies, so the edge orchestration and coordination with small base stations or unmanned aerial, uh, aerial vehicles and access point. So how is the, orchestra how is the topology uh, composed here? The second aspect regards content. So lightweight service framework for quality of service where services for mobile devices is one example, right? So how do we uh, consider the content here? And the third aspect would be computational offloading. So user profile migration and mobility management. So that is regarding AI for the edge. Um, there are grand challenges in this way of uh, AI for the edge. One is regarding uh, model establishment. So how to uh, do, how to restrain the optimization model. There are different approaches in literature. For example, stochastic gradient descent me uh, method or the mini batch gradient descent method. Then there are questions regarding algorithmic development. So selection of which edge device should be responsible for the deployment and execution in an online manner, right? That might actually change over time. As we had said, it is a volatile situation. So the edge devices might also come and go. So the algorithms need to cater for that. So the state of the art formulates a combinatorial and NP-hard optimization problem with high computational complexity in this. And thirdly, a grand challenge is the trade-off between optimality uh, and efficiency. So we have to consider the resource-constrained devices. As you remember, this compute continuum between IoT, Edge, Fork, Cloud has all sorts of different uh, capacities. So this is a fundamental challenge. And then finally, AI on the Edge discusses the top-down uh, perspective. Basically, it looks at questions like data availability. So, for example, as we have seen, uh, the, the, the challenge of the lack of availability and usability of raw training data for model training and inference is a fundamental problem. And the bias problem is also very real because the data is coming from different mobile devices, edge devices, etc. And the question is, what if there is a, the raw data is not available? Second aspect, model selection. So the state of the art requires selection of a need to be trained AI model, and that has a number of challenges, of course. The thresholds of learning accuracy and scale of these AI models for quick deployment and delivery is, is also a problem. And the selection uh, of probe training frameworks and accelerator architectures under limited resources is a problem. And finally, the coordination mechanism between these heterogeneous devices, clouds, and all of these middlewares and APIs is a fundamental problem. So as you can see, there are a number of different problems uh, still for AI on the edge or AI for the edge, which we have to master. So far, uh, we are still in the middle of the research in, in the different research communities. So there is no uh, you know, agreed upon or best way to do things. Ultimately, what we need to do is we need to manage the whole AI life cycle in an automated fashion because we have to create a pipeline which monitors available data, runtime performance data, etc., and then creates an automated uh, training and retraining loop. And this is, of course, a fundamental challenge that we all face in this community. Finally, I would like to provide you with a uh, uh, operations workflow uh, overview basically. If you look at this whole continuum what we were discussing, now map the AI part and map it to the infrastructure part and discuss along the lines of different data characteristics, model characteristics and enabling technologies and provide a, a number of use cases where this is relevant. And uh, we can distinguish different scenarios from cloud to cloud, cloud to edge, edge to cloud, and edge to edge, as you can see here on the left-hand side, regarding this data model and enabling technologies. 
And all of these built a matrix, basically, of different possibilities of where research needs uh, to, to go. So with this, I would like to conclude this presentation. Basically, we, we understood that we have to leverage the whole computing continuum from IoT, Edge, Fog, and Cloud. So we have a hybrid infrastructure set of components from the hardware and from the software, which we need to uh, develop, to monitor, to maintain, to manage, to govern. And the challenge is that these different infrastructure components are belonging to different organizational entities from telco operators to IT companies to private organizations, uh, etc., which is a fundamental challenge in itself. Secondly, the computational fabric for this intelligent aspect is being mapped towards these different infrastructure components, right? So we have AI for the edge, we have AI on the edge, and both of these have actually their own distinct research challenges, which we have outlined here. So, and finally, one of the underlying uh, messages I would like to give here is that we need to have a fundamental new perspective on all of this. We need to understand that um, we have to develop an ecosystem perspective on this infrastructure. We have to create a fabric view on this infrastructure. This fragmented way of designing systems, operating systems that like we did in the past is clearly not sufficient enough for the future. And with this, I want to thank you very much for your attention. And if uh, some of you are working in the space of uh, Internet of Things, I would like to encourage you also to submit your research work to a new uh, ACM transactions on the Internet of Things. With that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I want to thank you very much for your attention. And if uh, some of you are working in the space of uh, Internet of Things, I would like to encourage you also to submit your research work to a new uh, ACM transactions on the Internet of Things. With that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
Hi everyone. Our topic today is view short learning based on the straight view house numbers, and this paper was written by Yang Rundong, Deng Yanchong, Zhu Wanqi, Tong Xin, Chen Zhihao, and this is Yang Rundong making presentation. Okay, let's start. This presentation includes five parts: introduction, memo algorithm, experiment. Completion with Siemens network and conclusions, and I will give you a brief introduction in the first part. Deep learning has made significant progress, but this is based on a large amount of labeled data. However, it is impractical to obtain a large amount of data in real life. To solve such problems. Many few-shot learning methods based on deep neural nets has been have been carried out, and among these methods, memo algorithm and Siemens nets are with high performance, and this paper is based on these two methods. In the second part, I will briefly introduce the memo algorithm. This is the flowchart of memo. Each task is represented by T i, and f theta as the few shot learner that maps the original pixel character characteristic value x of the image to the output value, and theta is the parameter value of the learner. Extract text extract task T one from data set, and after a gradient iteration. A new temporary parameter theta one that adapts to the specific task is calculated. Then, query side from task T one is taken for testing, and the loss L T one F theta one of corresponding task T one is calculated. Then, the loss of different tasks will be kept generating until we get the loss of new task T n. And finally, the sum of test loss in different tasks is used for the parameters optimization. The parameters of the learner are updated by the gradient descent method, and finally, a set of initialization parameters are obtained. And these initialization parameters have strong generalization performance, and they can classify images from new tasks precisely. The learner used in this paper is a convolution neural net, which consists of four convolution layers and a full fully connection layer. Convolution kernel size are. Three by three, three by three, three by three, and two by two, respectively. And after each convolution layer, a ReLU activation function layer and a batch normalization layer are applied. And next part are results of experiment. Omniglot dataset is commonly used in few-shot learning experiment, but SVHN is A、shoot from the real world, so it should be more challenging. And in this part, we applied two-way one-shot, two-way five-shot, and five-way five-shot learning on SVHN dataset. And this page shows how we generate data used in two-way one-shot experiment. To ensure the reliability of the experiment, we divide the ten categories of SVHN into two parts.、Uh, one includes eight categories of images for training,、uh, named the training part, and the other includes the other two categories of images for testing,、uh, named the testing part. And for each task, extract two kinds of images、uh, from the training part, and then take one images、uh, from each of the two kinds of images as the sports site, and fifteen images as the query site,、uh, respectively. And the way to deal with the testing tasks is same as that in the training tasks, and. These are examples of tasks. Tasks.
uh, every row represents a task. In task one, uh, images we extracted are one and three. Uh, in task, task two, we extracted one and five, etc. And for the testing data, uh, since they are extracted from testing part, uh, they are four and seven, which means four and seven would not appear in the training data. And by inputting the above data into the memo model, uh, we record uh, the training accuracy and loss of each query site in training step. Uh, as we can see from the figure, uh, the growth rate is faster in steps uh, 0 to 1,300. And it starts to rise slowly after steps 1,300. And finally, the accuracy of training steps is stable at 89.9% uh, plus or minus 5.2% uh, after 3,500 steps. Take the parameters obtained in the training steps as the initial parameters of the test step and carry out one test step every 500 training steps. It can be seen from the table that after 3,000 iterations, the test accuracy of the memo model in this paper can reach 70.3% for two-way one-shot learning. And after this experiment, we extract the query site in test step and compared the pre predicted value and the true label of the images. Among the 10 images, uh, the pre predicted values of the first and fourth and the next are not consistent with the two labels and with an accuracy of uh, 70%, which is basically consistent with the test accuracy of the memo model. And similar to the method of extracting data in two-way one-shots, we extract two kinds of images from SVHN for each task. It can be seen from the figures that the accuracy of the training accuracy of two-way five-shot experiment increases and the loss decreases significantly faster than two-way one-shot learning. And the training accuracy and loss of the two-way five-shot experiment uh, also have a smaller fluctuation uh, range. And these are results of the test steps. After 1,500 iterations, the accuracy of the test is 80.1% uh, plus or minus 0.4%. We also extracted 10 images from the query site of the test task. Uh, from the images, the predicted values of the fifth and seventh images are different from the real labels, and the other predict predicted values are consistent with the real labels, uh, with an accuracy of 80% uh, consistent with the test results. And for the five-way five-shot experiment, we have five cans of images in the training part and the test part of the SVHN, uh, respectively. And the algorithm are the same as the two classification experiments. And after 3,000 iterations, the training accuracy can be uh, stabilized at 98% uh, uh, plus or minus 0.5%. And the accuracy of the test is 53.6% uh, plus or minus 3%. In order to show clearly the performance of MEMO for few shot learning with SVHN data sites, uh, we refer to the results of MEMO for few shot learning with uh, OmniCloud and Mini Image Net. And in addition, we also apply the MEMO model to the uh, MINIST data set as a reference. Uh, 
And among these results, the experiment accuracy of Omniglot data sites is much higher, higher uh, than that of other data sites. And the accuracy of MINIST data set and mini image data set is the second and the third. Well, the accuracy of uh, SVHN is the lowest. Uh, this proves that the relatively simple images have a higher experiment accuracy. Okay, and next part is the comparison with Siamese Sim nights. Semis net is still based on convolutional uh, narrow net, but unlike traditional CNN, the input data is paired. And in these pairs of data, if the two kinds of data are the same, label the pair of data as one. If the two kinds of data are different, label the pair of data as zero. And these two pictures have the same category, so the label is one. And these two pictures have different categories, so the label is zero. And this page is the results of five way five short learning based on semi night with SVHN. The accuracy of five way five short experiment with MEMO is five to ten percentage points higher than that of Samis Net. And these are results of MINIST. The accuracy of MEMO is seventy three percent, while the Samis Net is fifty nine percent. We also record the performance of traditional CNN model in 5v5 short learning. And this table records all of the experiment data of 5v5 short learning. And the percentage error of MEMO is lower than that of uh, semis uh, whatever for MEMO or MINIST. Uh, which means uh, the generaliz generalization performance of MEMO is better. And MEMO has better uh, stability when dealing with various types of few short learning tasks. And these figures show the dif differences more clearly. Uh, uh, as you can see, the black line represents MEMO and the red line represents Samis night and the green line represents uh, traditional CNN. And briefly speaking, uh, in our experiment based on SVHN and the MINIST data sites, uh, the MEMO has better performance, uh, both in terms of test accuracy and generalization performance. And uh, our, the last part is uh, conclusions. Our experiments include two-way one-shot, two-way five-shot, and five-way five-shot on SPHN. And the accuracy of these three experiments are about 70%, uh, 80%, and 50% respectively. And uh, for five-way five-shot learning, we compared the accuracy of MEMO uh, application on different data sites. Uh, the accuracy uh, based on simple data sites is significantly higher than uh, that based on complex data sites. Uh, also, uh, we verify that for SVHN and uh, MINIST data sites, MEMO has better performance than SAMIS network, um, both in the uh, test accuracy and general generalization performance. And uh, the test, and in our experiment, the test accuracy will be stable at a specific value, uh, which also verifies that the data sites with fewer categories can also be applied to the few short learning experiments. And thank you for your listening.
Hello, everyone. I'm Chen Xinning from Hunan University. I'm thankful to talk to you about my work, Efficient Missing Tag Identification in Large High Dynamic RFID Systems. I will introduce our work in terms of background motivation method and simulation. First, we introduce the background. Radio frequency identification technology has been widely used in many smart applications, such as inventory control in smart shops and logistic checking in supply chain management. By attaching RFID tags to objects and using the RFID readers to query the tags, we can identify each physical object. RFID is a technology that identifies objects remotely by radio waves. An RFID system consists of readers, tags, and a backend server. Each physical object in the system is attached with a tag with a unit ID. The readers is connected with servers. RFID readers send out query to nearby RFID tags and transmit the task replies back to the server. Usually, RFID tags is large-scale deployed in the system and tag cannot communicate with each other. The system uses the frame slotted Aloha protocol to transmit data between the reader and text. The reader frame includes F time slot and random CR when receiving the parameters. Each text selects a time slot with a hash function and transmits signal to the reader in its selected slot. This randomly slot selection generates three kinds of slots. The empty slot has no tags, the singleton slot has only one tag, and collision slot has multiple tags. The reader receives signals successfully in only singleton slots. Since the reader knows all the IDs of tags stored in the database, it knows the expected state of each slot by predicting the response slot of all tags with the same hash function. Missing tag detection and identification plays an important role in the RFID applications. For example, consider a large storehouse in which there are tens of thousands of goods labeled by RFID tags. We much want to know whether some goods are lost, and which goods are lost because of thief or delivery. Missing tag can be identified according to the expected state of slot. The expected state may be different from the actual state when there are tag missing. When the reader receives data transmit from expected singleton slot, the reader knows that the corresponding tag is present and confirms that it's not missing. Otherwise, if the reader doesn't receive data as expected, the tag mapping to this slot is missing. However, in practice, tags might enter the system and leave the system frequently. The newly entry tags will interfere with the identification process of missing tags, and thus will decrease accuracy of missing tags identification. The missing tag identification interfere by unknown tags is still a variable research issue. So in this paper, we study how to quickly identify missing tags in a high dynamic RFID system where unknown tags and missing tags coexist. Next, we introduce our motivation. To identify the missing tags in RFID systems, we can query all tags ID one by one and verify which one is missing. However, since each ID is 96 bits and most tags are stored in the database, only a small part of tag is missing. 
The method to collect all test ID is not a time-efficient method, and it's not suitable for large RFID systems that contains a large number of tags. Existing missing tag identification protocols perform missing tag identification without considering unknown tags or collecting unknown tags in advance. They cannot identify missing tags efficiently when they are interfered by unknown tag signals. Moreover, most of existing works are designed for static systems. They identify missing tags or unknown tags according to the changing of slot state. If an expected empty slot changes to a singleton slot or an expected singleton slot changes to a collision slot, it may be a new unknown task added to the system. However, we cannot use only the slot state to identify tags when unknown tags and missing tags coexist. For example, when unknown tags exist for a single slot without state change, we cannot judge whether there is a missing tag because it's possible that the tag is missing or out of reading range, and an unknown tag just enters the system and chooses to reply in this slot. To cope with the challenge of missing tag identification, when a no tag exists, next, we introduce our method to identify missing tag in a high dynamic RFID system. Considering that if the reader distinguishes transmission from tag in a slot, the reader can identify a tag. Therefore, we propose slot key matching method. The main idea is to identify a tag by means of slot position and reply key together. The test transmit keys to the reader. Key is used to identify a tag in a slot and can be predicted by the reader. Since key only distinguish tag in a slot instead of tag in the system, and tag in a slot is far less than that in the system. So we need to use only a short key of 10 bits instead of the tag ID of 96 bits, thus saving time. Based on this design, the expected singleton slot and some expected collision slots can be used for missing tag identification. And we propose our HDMI protocol to detect different tags in a slot with key. At the beginning, we predict the each slot and calculate the reply keys of the initial known tags. Then the reader starts to query the tags and collects the reply key from all interrogated tags. By comparing the actual reply key with all the expected keys, we can confirm if a tag is missing. When the reader doesn't receive an expected key in a slot, it means that the tag is missing. For example, as shown in the figure, the first slot doesn't receive key 1 as expected. Then we can quickly identify the tag that holds key 1 is missing. For the case that Collision slot changed to be singleton slot. As the third slot in the figure, we can also confirm that the key 2 is present while the key 3 and key 4 is missing. In the fifth slot, reader is best to receive replies of key 1 and key 4, but receive an, an expected key 3. It means that an unknown tag enters the system while test that holds key 1 and key 4 is missing. This complex case cannot be solved by existing works due to the existence of unknown tags. However, our HDMI 
identifies the missing test with high accuracy and efficiency. Finally, we conduct extensive simulation experiments to evaluate the performance of our method. We evaluate the performance of our HDMI protocol in the scenario of low dynamic, medium dynamic, and high dynamic. And we compare it with state-of-the-art solutions, including ERMI and SFMTI. Meanwhile, we also compare HDMI with two straightforward solutions, DFSA and BP. First, we study the identification accuracy of the protocol in three dynamic scenarios. The BP and DFSA can identify the missing text by the ID, so we only discuss the accuracy of SFMTI and ERMI and our HDMI protocol. As shown in the figures, we show the number of false positive tags which is identified incorrectly. SFMTI identifies a large number of false positive tags in the three dynamic cases. Although the HDMI and ERMI can meet the identification accuracy in the scenario of low dynamic and medium dynamic. Only our HDMI protocol meets the identification accuracy requirement in the high dynamic case. Next, we study the impact of identification accuracy. We observe the total execution time of different algorithms and the different required identification accuracy in the three dynamic scenarios. As can be seen, in satisfy of accuracy requirements, HDMI achieves higher time efficiency than the other method in the three scenarios. HDMI outperforms ERMI by reducing total time nearly 15%. SFMTI seems to use less time. However, as previously, SFMTI cannot satisfy the required identification accuracy. A large portion of missing tag cannot be detected by SFMTI. Then, we studied the impact of unknown tags by varying the number of unknown tags and observing the total execution time of different protocols. We can see that under the same required identification accuracy, HDMI has higher time efficiency for missing tag identification, especially in the high dynamic environment. The SFMTI silences or identifies text based on the one-bit reply result distinguish the unknown text. Many unknown text are silenced as the identifier present text, which causes the missing text cannot be found out accurately. Thus, its identification accuracy is far from the required identification accuracy. Next. We show the impact of missing text by varying the number of it. We can find that the execution time of DFSA and HDMI decreases with the increasing number of missing text. The reason is that the more missing text, the fewer text to be identified in the system. Due to the number of initial non text remains unchanged, the execution time of the BP remains unchanged and SFMTI's identification accuracy doesn't meet the required identification accuracy, even if it has the least time. And more important, HDMI achieves higher time efficiency than ERMI and DFSA. Then, we investigate the performance of total execution time and the different number of initial non-tags, which vary from 
10,000 and 15,000. As shown in the figures, the execution time of all the methods increase with the increasing number of initially non tests and our HDMI outperforms the other method in terms of time efficiency, especially in the high dynamic case. That's all. Thanks again for watching our presentation. If you have any question, please email us. Goodbye.
Dear experience and scholars, my name is Hao Bin. Today, the project I will introduce to you is the self-secure communication protocol of the Internet of Things, which will be introduced from the following aspects. The first part is introduction. 
The second is related work. The third is self secure communication. The first is experiment, and the last part is conclusion. Now, with the first part, we will introduce the back background and the significance. Now I will introduce the background of this research. First, with the repeat development of Internet of Things technology, the devices are getting closer and closer to our lives. Since the communication among IoT devices carries the sensitivity date which closely associate with the people's private lives, it becomes a prominent target. IoT devices have two characters, resource constraints, constraint, and complex depart. Deployment environments makes it difficult to design secure communication protocol for IoT. Next, um, my research have, has three implications. The first day is ensure the security of wireless communication data in the Internet of Things and protect user privacy and prevent information leakage. The second, it can automatically generate keys and effectively resist key theft attacks. The third is it able to automatically restore security. The third, the second part, we will introduce the related work uh, on the current research states in this field, focusing on research on key management protocols mainly divided into group key management and P2P key management. The first part is group key management, which is mainly divided into the following three categories. The first one is based on the logical key here whose disadvantages are poor heter heterogeneity and uh, corrosion text. The second is based on exclusion based system whose disadvantage are complex structure operation and uh, corrosion attack. The third one is based on the batch key update scam whose disadvantages couldn't generate uh, forward uh, security. The second category is P2P key management, which is also divided into three types. The first one is based on deterministic scam, whose disadvantage is our conspiracy to attack and the lack of flexibility. The second is based on poor probability probability scam whose disadvantages are high in energy consumption and poor connectivity. The third one is solution based on development knowledge whose disadvantage is a poor flexibility. Uh, next, uh, we will introduce the dynamic secret model. We, in <coughs> we use Entropy value HK to measure the security of communication data over security. HKT is a um, monotonic, mono, 
monotonic uh, non-decreasing uh, function. If the attacker doesn't master the dynamic security, then the key entropy at the two moment is very likely to be equal. For wireless communication methods such as Wi-Fi, even within a few minutes, it is difficult for a tanker to perform a perfect eavesdropping without losing information frames, which usually contains more entropy than uh, the key. Then, the loss of an information frame affects the attacker's mastery of the communication, causing them to lose the knowledge of the key. So, the influence on the entropy of the key can be eliminated, thereby ensuring, ensuring the security of the communication key is improved. As shown in figure 2.1, there are only two states of the communication, safe and unsafe. When a tanker doesn't uh, steal the key, the communication is uh, secure. On the other hand, if the tanker gains all knowledge about the key, the security will disappear completely. Moreover, the communication the communicating parties usually can't perceive the stolen key. The 95 protocol proposed uh, scheme changes the situation to figure 2.2. In the communication scenario with dynamic secrets, even, you, even if the key is stolen, in the very short communication time, Thereafter, communication errors will gradually restock security, which is called security supplement. The third part is the self security, secure communication. Uh, we will introduce according to the following aspects. The first uh, is core ideas and the innovations. Um, we see this picture is the packet loss phenomenon that usually occurs in wireless channels. Our research innovation is to use this feature to define a communication key that can dynamically change with the communication process and can quality restore security after the key is leaked. State package in this protocol contains seven fields, which are face, return, length, securance, run, message, and HMAC. And then, next, the construction of the date package is introduced. First, uh, connect uh, all fields except, except uh, the HMAC field to form the plain text date packet. And then use the PAD function to fill the pa date package, packet and then use the encryption key to encrypt the field date Packet to obtain the cipher text and calculate the HMAC value and the egg value. Finally, the cipher text and HMAC are contacted to construct the sending date packet. Here we will introduce the extraction process of the date packet. First, extract the cipher text and the HMAC value from the received data packet. Then use the encryption key to decrypt the data packet to obtain the plain text. Then use the plain text data packet to calculate HMAC and egg. 
finally checks the integrity and authenticity. Next, we will introduce the negotiation stage. After receiving the request packet, the receiver considered whether to negotiate the uh, key with the sender. If he agrees, he will reply to accept the date packet. If he doesn't agree, he will remain silent. The sender sends an NS render message packet, rent packet, and mark each packet with a serious numbers and save all random message and the corresponding series numbers in the memory. Mm, the third, the, receive, the receiver receives an extra uh, random message and if it uh, encounters a date packet with the same sequence number, it is discarded. Judge whether the equal is established. If so, the key generation process as follow. Um, generate, then generate a derived key. Use the compressed function such as zigzag to compress random message sequence numbers. Um, then calculate each MAC respect and construct the response date package. First, um, after receiving the respect packet, the sender extra the set of serious numbers and uh, writes the corresponding random message calculation key link key D and uh, HMAC respect. After passing the integrity check, it is proved that the correct Corrected initial key is generated and the confirmation date packet is constructed and sent. Then we will introduce the communication stage. In this stage, in order to ensure communication efficiency, the protocol stabilized. Alice and Bob store some information needed for communication in the hard disk and the memory, respectively. As uh, show, as show. And then we started the standard algorithm. Algorithm. The first uh, case is uh, if the egg packet can be received normally. The integrated identified and the series number verification will be performed. If the received series number is greater than the stand one, the key will be updated according to the value of the retrieve field. The series the serial number and the communication tabs are increased by one at the same time. And finally, the date in the hard disk is updated. If the received serial number is greater than the stand one, then this is the selected confirmed date packet and the updated serial number and the communication tabs are the values in the received date packet. The second case is time timeout re, re, retransmission and then set the retrain field to one, regenerate the rand, random number and fill it in the rand field. Recalculate the value of H Mac and X, then increase the number of the retrain retransmission by one and determine whether the maximum retransmission is executed frequency. If it excuse, ex exceed, the communication will be ended and the communication failure will be reported to the upper level. The next, next the receiver 
algorithm is introduced. The first case is to use the latest in encryption key to decrypt the date packet. Then perform a complete heart check and perform different update operation according to the theory of number and the return value. The difference from the standard is that when the number of communications reaches W, the round key is stored in the hard disk. The second case is uh, if it can be decrypted with the previous round key in the memory of our the W round key in the hard disk, then this state packet will may be retransmitted over time or sent after a party crisis. The difference from the first case is that the calculated new key replaces the old start in the memory and hard disk. The third situation is to use the last W round key stored in the hard disk to decrypt the date packet. Then this situation may be that one of the two communication parties crashes in the W round. At that time, the updated key replaces the old key in the memory and the hard disk and replace the W round key in the memory. The fourth part is the experiment. First, uh, the system prototype and the implementation are introduced in the first aspect. This experiment uses, uses Raspberry Pi 4 version to simulate the terminal device and use the Bluetooth channel for data transmission. In the first uh, laboratory feasible experiment, the packed loss rate of the channel must be started by changing the distance between the two communicating parties and the number of date packets sent it. It was found that um, it was uh, it was found that there will be a packed loss rate in every situation, thus proving that this protocol is feasible. Compare the second laboratory is comparing the calculation cost through cost compression with some protocols in the reference. We found that this protocol have, has advantages in transmission cost. The final is conclusion. Uh, the final conclusion is that this protocol can be updated independently and can resist the key shift attacks. Finally, thanks everyone.
Hello, everyone. I'm Xiang Shuzhen from Hulan University. My report is about dead gallery system based on Matthew Loyo, eight computing nodes. Let's first introduce some background. As an extension and a supplement of cloud computing, each computing has the following characteristics. No latency, no bandwidth, data security, and edge application management. Based on the above characteristics, in the context of the continuous development of the Internet of Things, edge computing has effectively made up for the shortcomings of the traditional cloud computing mode, extended the capabilities of the central cloud to the edge, and achieved the coverage of more application seniors. Any devices can be connected to each other by accessing the internet and through the transfer of computing service platforms such as cloud computing platforms and edge computing platforms. Any device can use AI services to achieve intelligence. Therefore, by combining artificial intelligence with cloud computing and edge computing, artificial intelligence will be uniquitous and the interconnection of all things will become intelligent for all things and we will enter an area of intelligent cloud and intelligent edge. Taking the smart home salary as an example, the smart home system mainly uses a variety of sensor technologies combined with AI deep learning to continuously make adjust adjustments to the environment. At present, the realization mode of smart home is mainly controlled by cloud connection, which will lead to delay in data processing and greater dependence on cloud networks. Moreover, with the increase of smart home devices, the interconnection and the interaction between devices and the unified management of header heterogeneous devices have also become problems for the realization of smart homes in the future. Edge computing is gradually introduced into the smart home system. Real-time requests from smart devices are sent to nearby edge nodes. Computing services at the edge nodes process date requests and the dynamically plan smart device operating strategies. In the future development, the computing union of the smart home gateway may appear. As an edge load, it can realize edge autonomy separate from the cloud journey smart device and can ensure the security of home data and improve more efficient home smart device management. The training of AI service modes such as machine learning model, mo models and the deep learning models is a resource intensive task and its mode training requires a lot of computing, storage, and other computer resources. So, how to use network edge devices to collect and collect the data realization of AI service mode training is a very important issue. In the process of using network edge devices and collect data to implement AI service mode training, task data collection and offloading strategies and the training task resource allocation will all have an impact on the quality of AI service mode training results. 
Secondly, most of the computing tasks that need to use the AI service mode are real-time tasks like real-time traffic and road condition analysis, real-time weather forecasting, real-time video or imaging analysis, and so on. The tiny completing of real-time tasks is related to the interest and the reputation of the service provider as well as the quality of use experience of the users who use the service. Therefore, we propose a multi-nodal age data collection system which can better meet the requirements of low latency and high real-time tasks in new salaries in the future. The system includes sensor loads and edge loads. The sensor loads are in the leaf layer. The edge survey the edge server is the edge load and is located in other nodes. The members in each cluster are fixed and the cluster head is set in the edge server of the next node. The cluster head can collect the data of all cluster members in the upload and distribute the sampling tasks and use the collected data to make an AI mode, AI mode training. We use roundworks to determine the measurement matrix. For example, there are four works in the figure. And the first one goes through loads 2, 4, and 5. And the position in the corresponding matrix becomes 1. Then use the stopping rule to ensure the quality of the date. When the error between the previous reconstruction Reconstruction and the next reconstruction is less than a certain threshold. The data collection can be stopped this time. The data collection edge layer. First of, first of all, input the orange assigned M of the measured value of each cluster. Then calculating the salience value SI of each cluster in the ice node and this cluster head according to the data reconstructed by the cluster head in the I plus one's node. The next is according to the salience value SI calculating the wetting factor yi of the value of the data carried by the load. The following is update the measured value of each cluster. Last, we use the updated measurement value to perform compression measurement on the data of each cluster. About the training the task assignment process, First, it is necessary to determine whether the requested training is feasible by combining the requested amount of data with the current computing resources. Using the CPU for calculation, we can obtain constraints on the storage capacity and the computing capacity of the edge training load, and the sum of the computing capacity and the storage capacity of all tasks does not exceed the sum of the load three holes. After the training task of the edge computing load is completed and the updated mode is obtained, the training request information is summarized and uploaded to the 
design logic edge computing loads at the last level of the system for large LV mode training. Therefore, the closer the system is to the source load, the more real-time passes it may best. It is very likely that edge loads have insufficient computing power and insufficient resources. Therefore, we need to adjust our thinking. If computing and resources are insufficient, the request should be moved to the next layer to ensure real-time performance and low latency. The number of layers should not exceed three. Okay, let's introduce the part of experiment. The error rate and the SNR are used to represent the debt quality. The large amount of debt, the greater the cost. In this paper, the debt volume of the first lawyer is related to work level. Each work generates one union of date. The generation of work is directly determined by in the stocking rule. So the communication overhead is indirected, indirectly expressed as the relationship between work level and perceived. For each training task request, the system proposed in this paper will determine whether the training task is accepted by the edge load and which edge nodes should collect the task and is dead for training. Depending on the goal of the problem, we should consider the number of tasks and the system accepts as a performance measure. Different variables should, such as the storage capacity of edge loads and the number of data source loads will affect the number of training task requests received by the system. In this paper, the experiment uses the experimental data source of C surface temperature in addition two sets of single collected lamp uh, and the other conditions were simulated for experiments. The second group of singers are separate singers, and the third group of singers are suddenly no separate singers. There are 1024 loads are set up, and the entire structure is divided into four layers. The first layer is divided into 60 clusters. Each cluster has 64 nodes. The second layer is divided into four clusters, and each cluster contains four cluster head nodes. The four cluster head nodes in the third layer upload data to the data processing center in the first layer. In the, in the first scenario, the round work scale is set to 30, and the stop rule selects the only one work at a time. When recording is stopped, measure the M value of the amount of data uploaded to the second layer. In the second layer, comparison of the paper 9. The sum measured value M is used to compress and upload to the third layer, and the sampling rate after the third layer is sent to the same sampling rate of 0 0.9. According to the grading theory, the, in order to collect the more training task requests, the system should first select those training task requests that provide the least amount of data. Under the grading strategy, we first select the training task request 
with the least amount of debt, and then randomly put the training task request. And the debt is it provides into the H load. The total number of H loads in the greedy sort is the sum of all the eight nodes that can collect the debt required by the task. For different singers, the setting of Kersi affects them to different degrees, but they all directly affect the quality of the reconstructed debt when the algorithm stops. In the first picture, the setting range of Kersi is 0 0.01 to 0 0.05, and the error ratio is higher, th higher than 0 0.1. The larger the Cassis-18, the larger the error ratio, which indicates that the quality of the debt increase with Cassis. As Cassis increases, the value of M as, as the time of stopping also becomes smaller. The smaller the value of M, that is the less that need to be updated, which directly affects the overall communication overhead. The setting range of per C in the third picture is 0 0.01 to 0 0.05, and the range of M value is basically between 300 to 650, which is e equivalent to the same rate between uh, 0 0.3 to 0 0.6. And the first picture, the e uh, equivalent to the safety rate between 0 0.7 to 0 0.9. From the picture, it can be seen. The algorithm in this paper significantly improves the debt quality compared to the traditional algorithm, especially for the two sets of single debt after mutation. The improvement of effect is more obvious. This picture shows the impact of the storage capacity of the end training loads on the number of training task requests received by the system. As the upper limit of the storage capacity of the age training load increases, the performance of the system is getting better and better, probably more than the greatest strategy collect, collect about 30% of training measure requests. Okay, this is the main content of this article. In all, the system guarantees the quality of the collected debt will save the amount of debt that needs to be uploaded. And the system can better adopt the edge load use AI mode, mode, models for data training. Thank you, that's all.
Hello everyone, <coughs> I will introduce my paper resource allocation method of each size server based on two types of virtual machines in cloud and each collaborative computing architecture. I will introduce my thesis according to six points, which are introduction, architecture, and workflow. Resource allocation for IO intensive virtual machine. Resource Allocation for CPU-intensive virtual machine, experimental and the results and the conclusions. In the industrial field, the Internet of Things can act actively sense and remotely control all physical devices in cloud manufacturing scenario in the existing network in infrastructure by mapping the contents obtained from the physical world to the state of the information world. It can reflect the full life cycle process of corresponding physical equipment and effectively achieve digital twin. The cloud and edge collaborative computing architecture balance the computing load, reduce the hardware equipment of the edge side servers and makes the edge side servers smaller, lighter, and cheaper while ensuring capacity. In the process of the resource allocation, we need to use the available space as a measure to ensure that the edge server can continue oscillate store date. In this background, this paper proposes a resource scheduling <coughs> scheme and the algorithm for cloud and edge collaborative computing architecture for edge size server clusters in industrial scenarios. <coughs> Figure 1 illustrates the proposed architecture. It consists of a cloud component consisting of a remote server cluster and an edge and end component consisting of an edge side server cluster. The service platform of the industrial big data platform includes a task scheduling control model, a data dictionary machine model, and a data processing model. The data dictionary matching model uh, monitors and uh, Managers the business logic. 
and uh, returns the data parameters of uh, the corresponding model information to the edge site server to achieve faster edge site server data processing. The data processing model specially processes the data collected by the data acquisition model for different data scales, including machine learning, deep learning, and uh, traditional data an analysis methods. The data re resource layer mainly include a core database, a business uh, uh, auxiliary, auxiliary database, a field system. The core basis is uh, responsible for the cloud data collected by the storage de device since layer device. The service uh, uh, the auxiliary database can use the re relational database such as uh, Oracle to assist the rapid processing of the system. The field system adopts the HDFS distributed field system. The device scenes layer mainly includes uh, various uh, sensors, including on the industrial equipment, equipment such as uh, temperature, pressure, vibration sensors, or smart factory equipment such as uh, controllers and the uh, range of finder. Figure 2 shows the workflow of the proposed architecture, the date acquisition device and the request action of the user are collectively referred to as a collector. The intelligent terminal simply pre-processes the information of the collector and sends it to the computing node in the cluster of the HSI server. The IO-intensive virtual machine in the computing node is responsible for receiving and storing it in the database of the storage node. On HSI server processing, the intelligent terminal device sends the collected data to the edge data storage model. The data processing model obtains corresponding data from the HSI data storage model according to the requirement of the user. The data processing model performs lightweight big data analysis according to the model parameters provided by the data dictionary model and uh, synchronized is to the edge side data dictionary model. The decision model feeds back to the intelligent terminal to perform corresponding control according to the result processed by the data processing model. The edge side uh, server uh, synchronized uh, the incre incremental data to the remote uh, centralized data storage model. The edge side server synchronized the incremental data to the remote uh, centralized uh, data storage model. The data processing model performs heavily heavy weight weight big data uh, analysis according to the model parameters provided by the data dictionary model. The synchronized to the remote data dictionary model. The remote data dictionary model will synchronize the data and the age data dictionary models according to the specific needs. The HSI server and the remote synchronized server pre periodically analyzes and uh, mine the stored data to update the, dic dic the dictionary to ensure the actual uh, accuracy of the decision message. In the industrial scenario, the amount of data sent by the terminal equipment developer the, in each factory is different for different uh, factory equipment and uh, actual business needs. Therefore, it is uh, necessary to design scheme 
for the each side server equipped with different factories, thereby uh, scientifically reduce the uh, per 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 securement forms of uh, entire pairs and avoids the waste of uh, limited uh, resources. Collaborative computing enables the processing of large-scale manufacturing workshops. These are important uh, uh, parameters of uh, most uh, uh, mechanical equipment uh, do not change uh, uh, frequently. The Mechanical characteristics of the mechanical equipment determine that most of the parameters will remain sta stable. Taking the posting condition of the fluid equipment as an example, the state and the outlet pressure are strongly uh, correlated in most cases, and the outlet pressure gradually Collapse from the safely initial value to the stable value and change stable according to the business demand of the uh, manual equipment. Therefore, they obtained the uh, dimensionality information from uh, three aspects of IO intensive virtual machine namely, the weight W of the data type uploaded by the terminal device the pre-allocated uh, uh, space uh, as pre, corresponding to each I.O. intensive uh, virtual machine in the computing node, and the actual occupied space uh, as post, and uh, generate the maximum uh, priority uh, list to uniformly uh, locate uh, hardware uh, resources in real time. In this section, we will obtain the priority PI of each uh, virtual machine through the uh, dimension information of the three aspects of the IO intensive virtual machine. It can be known from equation 3 that a virtual machine of a VI has six states in the time Ti to Ti at 2 times sigma i period and is presented by a set status equal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, where 1 is a noted state, 2 is a reduced state, 3 is a safety state. 4 is the um, increased state, 5 is an equally warning state, 6 is uh, the excessive state. In this section, we will handle lightweight edge computing tasks with the CPU intensely intensive virtual machines. Combined with the equations 12 and 14, it is necessary to increase the number of corresponding C add caused by a maximum priority list of no less than C and no more than D CPU intensive virtual machines. The virtual machine is in the H side server are mainly divided into IO intensive and CPU intensive virtual machines. IO intensive virtual machines are mainly responsible for receiving and storing data. CPU intensive virtual machines are mainly responsible for lightweight edge calculation of date. At the same time, the IO intensive virtual machines use the peer-to-peer -peer mode to receive the date sent by the terminal devices, as shown in figure 4. 
uh, dupling storage from uh, computing reduce uh, interference uh, between the uh, uh, servers and the uh, help servers become more efficient. In this section, we will get the performance of the modified uh, algorithm through the Stalin X uh, virtualization platform. We create a virtual environment as an edge side server through the Stalin X uh, vir virtualization platform, including one controller node, four IO intensive virtual machines, and three CPU intensive virtual machines. For the Specific uh, configuration of the above examples, see table 1, table 2, and table 3. We run the client service of the resource allocator on four IO intensive virtual machines which are responsible for monitors the I.O. performance of the virtual machines. The priority is obtained by calculation and sent to the controller node. The server service of the resource allocator running on the controller node is responsible for collecting the priority of the I.O. intensive virtual machine and, uh, responsible, uh, and responding to the uh, resources uh, request of the I.O. intensive virtual machines according to the maximum prior, uh, priority list, as shown in Table 4. We compare the algorithm with the genetic algorithm and obtain the performance data of the two algorithms in the experimental sense. We can see that the algorithm guarantees the allocation of resources with the optimal responsible response of the IO intensive virtual machines with a simply width of 4. However, due to the uncertainty of a random number, the genetic algorithm is not responsible enough to allocate resources. Results are shown in Figure 6. We run Hadoop and Spark distributed storage and the computing frameworks on three CPUs intensive virtual machines. Common CPUs intensive applications are Volcom, Sort, Terra Sort, Random Writer. For the above mentioned types of CPU intensive applications, uh, we generate uh, different scale test data sets th uh, through Highbench and uh, store them in the HDFS file system and uh, submit them to Spark to perform the corresponding tasks. The specific uh, uh, parameters of the task are shown in Table 6. According to the initial resources uh, configuration in Table 3, we can get the maximum uh, execution time of the application in the three cases of uh, preceded distributed conditions, fully distributed conditions, and uh, multi task con Call computation as shown in Table 7. The algorithm used in this paper starts from the impact of a virtual machine on physical machine performance and the impact of different configured virtual machines on task execution time. The optimal resource allocation methods for CPU-intensive virtual machine is given. The experimental results are shown in Table 8 and Figure 8. By comparison, the algorithm used in this paper is fast and suitable for the IQ, uh, actual test, less uh, inspection environment.
In this paper, the cloud and the edge collaborative computing architecture and the edge sized cluster resource allocation method were proposed. For the I.O. intensive virtual machine, the priority the H.I.O. intensive virtual machines is given in combination with the second order difference method. And finally, the resource allocation algorithm of the dynamic adaptive I.O. intensive virtual machine is realized. For the CPU intensive virtual machine combined with the application scenario of the test list in the actual production environment. The dynamic adaptive CPU intensive virtual machine resource allocation algorithm is realized. Compared with the other heuristic algorithms, the simulation results shows, show that the edge size server store state and the calculation speed of this algorithm were significantly improved.
Okay, thanks everybody for participation. And uh, finally, I'd like to announce the best paper of ICECI 2020. The best paper goes to low carbon emission driven traffic speed optimization for Internet of Vehicles. The first author is Wen Jie Chen. Congratulations. I think that's all for our conference. Thanks. Hope to see you again next year.